Good evening. We're now reconvening the regular governing board meeting for September 18th of the Vallejo City Unified School District Governing Board. Roll call, please. Trustee Waterman. Present. Trustee Mumson. Present. Trustee Stewart. Here. Vice President Ubaldi. Here. President Wilson. Present. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The board met in closed session. No actions were taken. Item 4.1, minutes of August 21st, Governing Board meeting. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Director Uvalde. Madam President, if there are no uh, additional or correction, I'll be happy to move that we adopt the minutes of August 21st, 2013 Governing Board meeting. Second. It has been moved and seconded that we adopt the minutes for August 21st. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The Aye. minutes but for... Madam President, I must abstain because I was not at the meeting. Thank you. One abstention. Minutes of the August 21st uh, Governing Board meeting are approved. Adoption of the agenda. Are there any additions, corrections, removals? If there are none, I would move to adopt this agenda for the evening. Second. It has been moved and seconded, moved by uh, Director Stewart, seconded by Director uh, Mumpson, that we adopt the agenda as printed. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The agenda is adopted as printed. 6.1, resolution number 2602, commemorating Dr. Martin Luther King's I have a dream speech. Director Shackelford, um, Dr. Shackelford, I'm sorry. I'll take her place, President Wilson. Okay. Um, this evening, the board is being asked to adopt resolution number 2602, an acknowledgement of the 50th year anniversary of Dr. King's speech on the Washington Mall. And so, I'd like to turn it back over to you, President Wilson, and if you have a suggestion as to the reading. Director Stewart, would you read uh, resolution number 2602? Thank you. Uh, and maybe we'll all read one paragraph. Beginning well. with Director Stewart. Where is it? Resolution number 2602. Whereas, on August 28, 1963, when the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered in Washington, D.C., the I Have a Dream speech, which is one of the greatest speeches in our nation's history, approximately 800 citizens marched peacefully in downtown Vallejo with placards from civil rights is a must um, to let's present the true American image to the freedom-loving people of the world. While signaling while, excuse me, while sing, singing the iconic civil rights song, We Shall Overcome. Director Mumpson. Whereas on that same historic day, a quarter million men and women, young and old, filled our gate capitals landscape in Washington, D.C. to take part in what the Dr. King called the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. As diverse people were woven together, like a great American human tapestry, sharing in the dream that our nation 
would be one day make real the promise of liberty, equality, and justice for all. Director Waterman. Thank you. Whereas the March on Washington capped off a summer of discontent, a time when the call for civil rights was met with imprisonment, bomb threats, and brutality, and the marchers endured billy clubs and or fire hose blasts, and yet they chose to respond with nonviolent resistance, with a fierce dignity that stirred our nation's conscience, and paved the way for two major victories of the Civil Rights Movement, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Director Ubaldi. And whereas, as we remember, that March on Washington was a demonstration for jobs and justice, and the coalition that brought about civil rights understood that racial equality and fairness for workers are bound together, because when one American gets a raw deal, it jeopardizes liberty. Equality and justice for everyone, and these are lessons we carry forward that we cannot march alone, that our American that America flourishes best when we acknowledge our common humanity, that our future is independently linked to the destiny of every soul on earth. And whereas it is not enough to reflect with pride on the victories of the civil rights movement, and in honor of men, women, and children of all races who left footprints on the National Mall or in downtown Vallejo. We must make progress in our time and let us guard against prejudice, whether at the polls or in the workplace, whether on our streets or in our hearts. And let us pledge that in the words of Dr. King, we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And whereas in our great melting pot country of the United States of America, the city of Vallejo has been honored as the most diverse city in America. And we are very proud, we are a very proud city that celebrates our diversity with numerous cultural and ethnic events throughout the year. Now, therefore, I'll, I, Dr. Ramona Bishop, or Dr. Ramona Bishop, Superintendent, stakeholders, and the governing board of the Vallejo City Unified School District do hereby call upon all citizens of Vallejo to observe throughout the year with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Justice, and to celebrate our beloved city of Vallejo's title as the most diverse city in America, passed and adopted this 18th day of September 2013 by the governing board of the Vallejo City Unified School District, Solano County, California. Let's now adopt this. Happily. Madam President, it would be my honor to move to approve this resolution. I second that motion. It has been moved and seconded that the Vallejo City Unified School District adopt resolution number 2602. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution number 2602 is now adopted. Thank you. Would um, anyone like to speak? We have Mr. Um, uh, Nestor Verde Aliga here, uh, Tony Summers, and, and Luther Hendricks here. So would uh, someone come forward and would they speak, please speak? Well, I'll try to be brief. Um, Back in uh, 41, when the war was first broke out, uh, things was much different than when Dr. King came along. But thank God that he came along 
and led us in a way that we'd become nonviolent because in my younger days I was violent and mm -hmm. with him I learned to love and to be loved and be very brief in my statement. I have a dream. It's finally coming true, but we're not there yet. And I thank the board for this time that they allowed me to speak. Thank you. Uh, mind standing with me? Uh, Dr. Bishop and board, it certainly gives me a great pleasure to stand here with Mr. Hendricks and the legacy, the living legacy that he is, and he's actually wearing the Congressional uh, Gold Medal. And so we are excited for uh, a man like this to still be able to stand and to represent us in the city of Vallejo, um, which we have now been known as the most diverse city in America. And how exciting is that? And as we think about uh, Dr. King and the March on Washington some 50 years ago, and when I thought about what he said, that uh, we as a people will one day get to the promised land, how exciting that is, where he talked about uh, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, and I'm sure in this day he would have thrown in the, uh, put, a, put in the LGBT community, but all of us being diverse people in this city, being able to live together, work together, love together, strengthen one another, and build our community and going forward. I'm really proud of our school board taking the time out to continue the legacy of Dr. King, and it just really means a lot. So thank you so very much for this privilege. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Verda Aliga, would you like to say something? I'm good. Okay, good. Thank you. This is a um, resolution that we are very proud to uh, adopt, and we thank all of you for um, coming this evening, Mr. Hendricks, Mr. Summers, and Mr. Verda Aliga. Is there anyone else? Do we have cards on this agenda item? Madam President, may I? Yes. May I uh, ask uh, a favor? I'm, I've not had a chance to meet a congressional honor, <laughs> a medal honor, and and also to stand on, his, on uh, to honor him. May I have the p privilege of standing and giving a <laughs> an honor to him? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, and congratulations, Mr. Hendricks. Madam President? Yes. May I speak? Yes. Thank you. Um, I can't think of a better body, a governing body, to have presented this resolution. I understand that there are people presenting this resolution everywhere across the globe, as it should be. But the work that we do here in our district, it taps into the absolute seed of where that liberty and that love and kindness for the future starts. I tell my children that it is possibly the most hard, the most difficult thing you'll ever do, being kind to a person who is unkind to you. It's a, it's a big challenge. We're working very hard in our curriculum in relation to our bullying practices, our anti-bullying practices, our developing of the culture of this district so that we're a culture of inclusion and love. Pastor Summers, I, I appreciate very much you bringing up the LGBTQ community in that, in that regard because I have no doubt in my mind, knowing the spirit, the inspired, luminescent spirit of Dr. King, that without a doubt there would have been some inclusion. Mm -hmm. And knowing that one of his right-hand men, Baynard Rustin, such a marvelous activist and an out gay man who helped facilitate that very, that very march on Washington, we, um, we, those of us who might consider ourselves part of the LGBT community, which I, I do and my family does, um, thank you very much for saying that in public. And, uh, and I'm very honored to have been able to pass this resolution. Thank you. Any other board members? We're just very pleased. And um, 
thank you gentlemen for being here. Do we have any student representatives? Yes, we do. Okay. Ziffy Lewis yeah. from MIT Academy to give his report. Um, so I'm Ziffy Lewis. I'm the new uh, board representative for the VCUSD from MIT Academy. And um, I'm out to report that uh, the seniors goal of $90,000, we've uh, raised 25000 this so far from uh, the start of um, July. And um, we have an upcoming fundraiser for the school on this Friday at um, our school from 6 to 9. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. Stay, stay up here. Oh, stay okay. up here. Sorry, it's my thank, first time. <laughs> thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you at all future board meetings. We, continue, we uh, uh, definitely consider uh, MIT a part of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we support your programs. Um, I didn't see whose light come on first, came on first, but of course the ladies are always first. So, uh, <laughs> Director Waterman. Thank you. Uh, Ziffy, welcome. Thanks. Now, tell us, the fundraiser I'm assuming is for the trip to Washington, D.C.? Yes. Okay, so you'll, be make, you'll make sure to take really good pictures of the new Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> Memorial and yes. do a presentation at the end of the year when you finally come back? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, I have, a, I have a question for you yeah. that I've heard um, some, some dis, uh, discontent at your school about new uniforms. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> just, I know it's just your opinion. <laughs> um, well, this year they um, implemented that we have to wear uh, dicky straight leg pants and dicky polos, um, only khaki pants and the polos with the patch. And uh, we were allowed a one year grace period, which hasn't been we weren't able, we're not allowed to wear MIT shirts or anything, only on select Fridays. So there's uh, a lot of issues going on, especially since uh, if we're out of dress code, we have to wear these uh, scrubs mm -hmm. that they provide for us. And a lot of times it's a uh, 3XL or <laughs> larger, so. So these are medical scrubs that you're meant to put over your clothing if you don't have the correct yes. uniform, I see. Um, well, I don't have a copy of the MIT Charter uh, petition anymore at my home, so I don't remember if there was anything in particular about mm -hmm. this, uh, this um, issue, but I wonder if we couldn't look into that and see if that's uh, a problem or not as a district. And what happens when you, when you don't wear a uniform and you have your scrubs? Is there other kinds of punishment or um, punitive? Well, if they run out of scrubs, you have to uh, run laps. Or um, you get Saturday school or uh, the after school detention, which is Tuesdays and Thursdays. I see. Okay. And then, like, these laps that you're running, they're during your class time? I, yeah. From, well, I, I don't come out of dress code, so. Attaboy. But <laughs> <laughs> the, the students that do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate you uh, illuminating that for us, and I look forward to seeing you at our next board meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did the parents... Um, have any approval process of these? Uh, or could we look into that um, uh, of uh, the dress code? Well, uh, they, they they said they sent out a survey to every parent, but my father and a lot of other parents haven't got the survey. Okay. It was only a select group of parents, but okay, um, yeah. okay, we get the picture. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> Director Mumson. What, um, what time of the day is the fundraiser? Um, this Friday from 6 o'clock to 9 p.m. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Madam President. Um, uh, oh, yes. Is he through? Oh. Are you through? What? Just a moment. Yeah. Did, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, yes. Director Uvaldi? Uh, you started your fundraising in August? In, in July. July. The end of the last school year. And uh, you have 25 grand now? Mm hmm And when is the end of that? Um, we go to D.C. May, and May. so we have to raise the 90000 by May. And that's okay. just for the D.C. Nothing covers prom mm -hmm. or um, grad night. I, uh, I help raise a lot of money, mm -hmm. nonprofit organization, and I think I need to make an appointment to see you, see how I can, yeah. you can teach me how to do it. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you. Thank you. I do have one more question, and you may, I don't expect you to answer now, what kind of, uh, you said, what kind of um, shirt 
and pants. What's his, a, a name of a brand? Dickies, Dickies brand only. Dickies brand only. See, that uh, is, a, I believe, is maybe an issue also. Yeah, it's not the cheapest brand either, so. Yeah, but uh, an exclusive brand, I, I think there may be an issue there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent report. Um, now, I know there must be some mistake. Vallejo High School it has to be here. <laughs> no, they're not here. I'm, I'm messing with Clarence. <laughs> Oh, 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 the principal gave them the night off. Okay. <laughs> so he, oh, oh, yeah. So you're doing the report? Thank you. <laughs> Clarence is ignoring me. I thought you were referring to someone else. He is. Good evening. President Wilson, Vice President Dr. Uvalde, members Stewart, Mumson, Waterman, Dr. Bishop, members of the cabinet and community. I stand before you as a proud principal of Vallejo High School. And I'd like to tell you that academically, last week we have administered our CELT testing uh, and it's been a real success for our students having the CELT testing going on. Also last week we had um, our senior sunrise where we had over, out of our 300 students, we had 150 seniors show up at the Great Corpus Field at six o'clock in the morning and have 300 donuts and coffee and sung the fight song, uh, the alma mater, and got a chance to get in one big circle and just say how happy they are as seniors to uh, be part of Vallejo High School. Uh, and then go on their water world trip. I want to say we've had a, a grand opening of our school and getting all of our students uh, uh, to class and having a great time. So I want to say, say that there are a lot of great things happening at Vallejo High School. And so we also want to pay respect to our marvelous faculty staff and all of our parents. We also had a tremendous night at back to school night. Had standing room only uh, for our back to school night, which was last Tuesday. We also had a, uh, our uh, historical black college fair on the same day that had well over a thousand attendees and we received over a thousand dollars in scholarships for our students uh, at that event. So it was definitely been a grand event that all the great things are happening. more than a thousand dollars. More than a thousand. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It was over a hundred thousand dollars in scholarships great, for Vallejo great. High School. So, excuse me, but we had over $100,000. And when you can have $100,000 out of scholarships, out of students for academics, that says a lot. So again, I want to thank the newspaper and everyone for supporting Vallejo High School. Very good report. Are there any questions? Uh, Director Uvalde. Madam President, thank you. It's my understanding that uh, you will be making a presentation at uh, Ursula Award. That is correct. This added. And uh, I look forward to your uniform, a, a tux, in my understanding. I'm going to be clean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Right. Uh, Director uh, Waterman. Thank you. Um, Mr. Isidore, yes. I understand that you have quite a lot of new faculty at your school. 20. So I would like to know how they are doing and what kind of support systems we have for them and how welcome they feel into our district, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's a big number of people, yeah. and it's a not a simple job. It's right. a fabulous job. Right. Um, but how, how are we doing? Actually, all 20 teachers are really uh, adjusting and doing quite well at Vallejo High School. We're getting a chance to get in the classrooms and getting a chance to give them feedback. Each teacher has a buddy teacher that's a mentor. And so some of the great things that we're doing is having those teachers meet uh, with those buddy teachers and giving them all the help. We've gotten given them uh, like the buddy package of uh, some extra pens and all the things that they need to welcome them and checking in with them each day. We also have an administrator that oversees uh, the new teachers also. So the transformation and the welcoming is making our teachers just work even harder with our students. We receive so many compliments from our parents at back to school night on just the, 
the happiness and the hard work that all of our teachers, in, including our new teachers, are displaying with their children. Thank you. And I will say, as most of you know, I am frequently on Vallejo High's campus, and I'm there, and I make a point of being there uh, at least four out of the five days per week, and I come different times, um, from zero period to seventh period. Uh, this is one of the just uh, uh, calmest openings. Mm -hmm. uh, the students are in class. I mean, it's almost like a ghost town. Um, and I was uh, set in on a meeting this evening in the study hall where um, the athletic director had pulled the athletic study hall, the uh, uh, progress reports of the athletes. And it's such a difference at this time this year versus last year um, as to, so if you want to address, um, I don't know what is the change, but it is, um, uh, the grades are extremely uh, improved. So uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, bring that note to uh, you and compliment you and your staff on uh, uh, that particular point because parents are you know, very interested in uh, how well their students are doing. And um, uh, the, the, F, the athletic director was extremely pleased with uh, the, um, those are progress reports, four weeks grades, yes. One thing I want to uh, say that is working is uh, uh, PBIS mm -hmm. and uh, working with our students restorative justice. Mm -hmm. uh, as Dr. Andrade did say, when you win their hearts, you're able to now work with them. And we're getting a chance to win our students' hearts through uh, effective teaching strategies and just building great relationships. If we look at some data, uh, two years ago we were at 18,000 referrals uh, for a school year, and last year down to 6,000. And now we don't even have over 100 referrals at Vallejo High School uh, for almost 70 teachers uh, in a four weeks time. So if you just kind of look at the progress where we're going, our suspensions, expulsions, there's no, there, we aren't even there. And so I really want to uh, thank the great work that our faculty and staff are doing at Vallejo High School, the new Vallejo High School. Mm -hmm. And thank you for your leadership. Thank you. We appreciate your report. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to call Bethel? Excuse me? <laughs> Good job. Um, so now we've had our student principal reports. <laughs> um, any staff reports? Yes. President Wilson, we do have a staff report this evening. Um, we have our director of food services and uh, other things. Warehouse and all other miscellaneous items. Um, Carrie Braverman and her assistant director, Irene Reynolds, that would like to share a positive communication with you. Shorter than Clarence. Good evening. I'm Carrie Braverman, director of student nutrition services. And I'm Irene Reynolds, the assistant director for student nutrition services, warehouse and, and reaper and graphics. <laughs> I gave you the short title. So go ahead and start passing those out. So t this evening we want to present you with the first edition of our new Student Nutrition Services and Warehouse newsletter titled, Appropriately, Food for Thought. <laughs> so we plan on doing this newsletter quarterly, possibly, possibly more. And uh, this department letter is informative, it's fun, it's a great way for staff to keep connected to what's going on in, in our department. It's, it's geared for staff, but it's really for all to enjoy. So not only can staff be connected to what's going on in our department, but everyone else. So we hope you enjoy the first edition and um, you are on our mailing list to receive all future copies. And we have also, we are going to place copies on the back table for anyone who's present tonight that would um, like to take a look at the newsletter. Okay. Carrie, yes. uh, I noticed, since I'm on campus all, all the time, yes. um, the um, supper program is seems to be taking off quite well too, and I, um, it's interesting to see the students are there at the door waiting and ready to uh, get their meal. 
their after school meal. And I just commend the district for having the foresight to understand the importance that we, in the full service community school, that we support our students and our families, um, even not only at lunchtime, but at supper time also. Thank you, and we are actually going to be implementing that supper program at eight additional school sites this school year at the full service community, the new full service community schools that were just uh, implemented this year. Yeah. So uh, maybe since you're on campus four days a week, I might get you a t-shirt to help us spread the word <laughs> on the supper program the because supper we do program. we do want to try to increase our participation, especially at our high schools. Yeah. Uh, so I'm with a any group help that, that we could get from you would be great. That we um, do tutoring uh, uh, right after school, and so um, we are I are using the cafeteria, uh, the tables in the cafeteria Perfect. for the tutoring program. So. Um, that's how I know the students are at the door waiting I see. to get their supper. And they follow the rule about eating it in the cafeteria. But um, And the students that are doing the tutoring, I'm assuming, are participating as well? They, uh, the coach makes them go to practice. Uh, but those... We'll find time for them to eat. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> we'll work on that one. Director Stewart. Thank you. This is excellent. Thanks. Um, and you have September 2013 on here. Are, okay. are you hoping to do this monthly? Well, we we said quarterly, but we think we have enough material to potentially do it more often. So I I didn't make a commitment mm -hmm. on there. So I just did put I put September 2013. We you might see an addition in. We're we're shooting for November at this point for our next edition. Great. With all the varying. Uh, programs yes. and, and services. This is vital information for parents, caregivers, exactly. um, students. I would hope that um, either on our district website or even at the school district, or excuse me, at uh, the school site websites, we could have a location that links to this. You know, and, you, I, and, I've and talked to that, whether or not folks can sign up to have this sent to them electronically to their We've email. already checked with our website provider uh, mm -hmm. today about uh, linking it, putting it on our website for staff and community to, to see. So we're already on that. Excellent. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Director Waterman. Thank you. You know, I'm a huge fan. <laughs> you guys are really, really making amazing strides. We're trying. Um, <laughs> my children, who I, I've said it before, two years ago, I would threaten them with school lunches. <laughs> and now they always want to take school lunch. And Great. they're excited. Great. I mean, of course, they were at the um, Iron Chef. The Iron Chef cook-off. And did you notice the chicken adobo oh, on yeah. our menu? Oh, yeah. The and winning and recipe. It. Yeah. You know what I want in this newsletter? Yeah. Recipes. That's part of the material. It, it's, it's on our <laughs> list of things, too. But we had so much to pack in this oh, first wouldn't one. that be and awesome though the kids yes. come home and say mom can you make school's chicken adobo tonight <laughs> oh i don't know if we could share those for free those <laughs> recipes but i'll <laughs> i'll consider it <laughs> it's a thought anyways okay, i really want to compliment you because you. i can i can tell you from the children that i'm at my own home and at the school they fight i'm telling you they fight over those salad shakers i can't believe it Fantastic. all these elementary school kids are trying to beat each other to the salads You've, you've, you've struck on something terrifically well, we, golden. We, we tried to make the healthy food fun by putting it in a fun cup. It's amazing. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for all your Thank good you work. very much. Okay. Enjoy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great report. Any other staff reports? Uh, community members? Let me see. Berkey, did you forget your card? No, Berkey. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, Dr. Robert Suskel. Suskel. Sussel. Sussel. Hustle with us, S. Yes. Yes, Hustle. I'll try to be brief. I have a question and a request. Mm -hmm. When I asked at an earlier meeting about revising your website, Dr. Shackleford said that revisions were underway, but no timeline was given. So my question is, when do you estimate a revised website will be put up? And then my uh, request is, 
This is my third attempt to request that you consider changing the start time of this meeting to 6 or 7 p.m. like most of the other school districts and in fact all of the other school districts in the county to make it more accessible to the public. And in an earlier meeting you said that it was because of the state administrator that you were meeting at 5. And now that he's gone you have the ability to, to change the start time. And as, as the members of the board are aware, each of you has the right to put things on the agenda. Is one of you willing tonight to request the, that this be agendized for one of your next meetings or will my request be ignored? Thank you. Deborah Sears. Good evening, Dr. Bishop. Good evening. President Wilson, Trustees Ubaldi, Stewart, Mumson, and Waterman, hi. So I'd like to talk about confidentiality again. Um, previously, I stated in my comments that I don't want separate rules within the law. I asked what we follow, and we have FERPA and HIPAA, et cetera. And as I'm searching around the web, I see on the VEA website a, a, a separate confidentiality form that's available in lieu of signing the district form. So. Basically, I'll just, bottom line, unacceptable. Not sure why that's out there. So um, I'd, I'd like, you know, per Miss Watts, she said she's a parent first uh, type of person. So please help me understand how two forms helps parents. So is the VA creating separate policies and procedures also to comply with HIPAA and FERPA too? Are there separate business associate agreements? Are there separate legal notifications regarding privacy to me as a parent in this district? Um, are lawyers going to be uh, informed to name both the VCUSD and the VEA as liable for confidentiality breaches? Are the union deep pockets ready for that kind of legal action? For fines, lawyer fees, court fees, parent dissatisfaction, sanctions, does the VEA really understand the risk involved with creating separate types of forms in our district? Do they have the authority as a employee organization to even do that? It really makes me wonder the competency of the leadership of this employee organization in our community. I am you know how I feel about this. It is unacceptable to have two standards in our district about the rules and the lay of the land. We have board policy. The board, the district staff, the staff at school sites create forms. Employees have opportunity to comment on those forms as I do as a public person. So why is there a separate process? I, I really don't understand that. I am not comfortable with the com confidentiality in this district, especially if there are two ways to go here. So I hope the VEA understands the risk they have just created. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any more community service, com uh, community service forms, community? Uh, no more? Okay. Um, the community forum is now uh, closed and we'll go to reports from our board members. Director Waterman. Thank you. Um, I just have one thing to say, but I do have a couple of things that have just come up in my brain. I, I would love some clarity around what Deborah Sears just brought to our attention. I don't personally spend any time on the VEA website but I'd like to have some insight as to, I need some clarity around that, please. Um, and as Dr. Schussel has requested, I have absolutely no problem requesting a study group in regards to the start time of this meeting. Um, I think it should be a study group. Um, perhaps what we should do is set aside some time at a, at a meeting that's specifically for looking deeply into pros and cons and the implications of this and then uh, perhaps then at the following board meeting we can we can take a vote and and uh, make a make another decision make the same decision informed decision okay um, 
So with that, I'd just like to, I was sort of piggybacking. I didn't realize that we were going to get this lovely presentation by Carrie and um, Irene. But I want to encourage, and I really want to encourage every single parent in this district to apply for free and reduced lunches. I just did. And I have absolutely no embarrassment to tell you that my three children are now on free lunches because of the state of our family's economy. Not only is there nothing to be c worried, of, like there should be no stigma around that. And obviously, it's food I want the recipes for. <laughs> um, but it's also, it's, there's something very powerful, and I really appreciate that you put it in your, in your menus and in the uh, papers that go out to the parents. The more people who actually apply and are on these lists, the more likely we are to be able to go for certain grants, uh, find certain supports in our district. I'm more than happy to add my three children to, to those numbers. And I really, again, I want to encourage people who may never have thought of this as something that they would consider or would be within their, their, within their consideration. I want you to do, even if you have no intention of taking school lunch, I would like for all families to apply for this because if you are able to be part of those numbers, you are doing this district a service in a host of ways. So, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay. So we are actually, I just drafted a letter today to, we are looking at sending it out to the households that have not yet applied because now school meals, uh, student eligibility for school meals is tied to school funding in a way it had n never has been before. Mm -hmm. So we're actually looking at the computer system we use targets or identifies families that haven't applied. So we are looking at sending a letter home and encouraging them to apply exactly well, what if, you mentioned. Well, if I can be of any service to you in that regard, okay. Carrie, I'd be very happy to add my name to that. Okay. Thank you. Director Mumson. Wrong light. Good evening. Thank you very much. Um, sorry I missed the uh, meeting on the last meeting, but I was in Los Angeles. I, uh, my son has graduated high school and is now gone from the area, and I am a proud father of a first year. <laughs> UCLA student. Yeah. So that's all I have to say. Well, I can. <laughs> it's lots I of fun. Based upon experience, I can tell you, you're going to get lots of phone calls. Do you, uh, your bank accounts? How are they linked? <laughs> because that's the true test that the child has gone to college. <laughs> Director Stewart. Congratulations, Director Bumsley. Thank you. Uh, since we last met, I was able to attend uh, back to school night at uh, Bethel High School and Hogan Middle School. I also attended the City Council Candidate Forum um, that was held at the Council Chambers and hosted by the African American Alliance, Better Vallejo, uh, and the NAACP. And, uh, had a couple conversations while there, and I'm looking for the the fruits of the council members' uh, partnerships with the district moving forward, and and the realities that that actually comes about, and what we end up seeing. Um, yesterday, I accompanied President Wilson and Vice President Ubaldi uh, in attending the visit of the Tanzanian President to Vallejo, Dr. Jakaya Kikwete. Um, our uh, Superintendent Dr. Bishop made an excellent presentation highlighting the programs and initiatives uh, that are offered and uh, being implemented in this district. So I'd like to thank her for representing us mm -hmm. very, very well in that setting. And uh, finally, I would like to mention that uh, Solano County Transit, Soul Trans, is currently administering a ridership survey for um, Mayor Island, and we are taking a look at the interest and feasibility of a new fixed route to serve Mare Island. Uh, I know it's a challenge for some to get to these meetings or any business that uh, needs to be uh, handled in this building. And so if you are interested, you can visit our website, soultransride.com, 
and fill out uh, the survey to uh, participate. We uh, currently have it through next week, but we'll probably extend it um, if there is interest. So I invite you all to do so. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Director Uvalde. On uh, September 9th, I attended uh, an English classroom at uh, Jesse Bethel. I regret I forgot the name of the last name of the uh, teacher, but her first name is Shannon. Her last name st start with a start with an F. That's right. Thank you. And uh, and found out it was uh, an honor English class, and I have never been an honor <laughs> uh, English class. And so I was intrigued. Even as a student? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not when I was in high school. <laughs> and, and I noted uh, the two things that came to, to my mind is that there is now a tension between the classics and modern themes that are being, you know, they're struggling with that. And, and uh, you know, the, the Shakespeare and, and Hamlet and all that good stuff. Uh, I know I went through that in school. And then, uh, but now they're talking about uh, modernizing it and trying to learn because they find that learning is effective when students uh, can relate to them and now they have uh, subjects like the life of Pi and the lovely bones and and so they're going through that transition and they're in a dialogue about the kind of subjects and classics books that they that they're reading and then the other thing that I've learned in that uh, f 45 minutes in that class is is the uh, subject of slowing down the kids because they're so accustomed to texting and everything is immediate response. And they're trying to help the teachers, trying to help the, the, the students to, to, stop, to slow down. And it's not like when I was, again, when I was in college, I have to learn how to use the dynamics, Evelyn Wood dynamics, <laughs> remember that? And so you have to read and quickly and everything. And now the kids are being asked to slow down and, and so that they can really probe and try to understand complex texts and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and to, to have the capacity for uh, uninterrupted thinking. Because uh, with, with the computer and, and the, the, the telephone, phone, iPhone, uh, they're always being distracted. And so the, the thought behind the, the classroom experience that I heard is that they need to, be, to really go through a process of deep, deep thinking. And so I was intrigued by that. Since I was not a, in an honor class back in high school, I, I was thought maybe I may want to register and attend the class to see, <laughs> to see how well I, I would do today. The uh, second one is I attended a dialogue between VCAT and, and the school district. And there was a lot of um, uh, mutual concern in, in, in how to be helpful to our students. And, and one of the things that we just did the other day, uh, Monday, uh, in response to that meeting in September 9th, was to, to uh, donate uh, $1,500 to our school district to, to purchase a particular equipment that they need at the multimedia uh, class that the, uh, the teachers have been asking. And, and so we donated $1,500 for that, uh, for that uh, uh, particular equipment. Uh, the Wall to Wall Academy, I, I came in late, but I was able to, to visit on the 10th, uh, held down in the hall. And, uh, and uh, appreciate the invitation of uh, Eleanor, uh, Director Eleanor Bruton to attend the uh, st new staff orientation. So I was able to, 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 to greet them and express to them how much we appreciated them. I also attended the, uh, the 915 uh, Unity Day and was able to see uh, some of our uh, some of our staff in particular, the visibility of, a, of our superintendent, Dr. Bishop, who was greeting uh, most everyone that I could see. And then, uh, let me see, and I, I too, uh, thanks to uh, 
uh, Trustee Stewart was also at the Tanzania uh, President's reception. And that is uh, completes my report, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try and be brief. I was at many of the things that uh, have been identified by other board members. I did attend Bethel's back to school night as well as Vallejo High's back to school night. I also attended the uh, city council forum at um, City Hall and the um, reception of president's um, luncheon for uh, the president of Tanzania. And again, our superintendent was dynamic and well represented us. In, um, and I, it was very interesting watching um, the audience and the surprise on their face about many of the things that are, that are happening in the district. And uh, it was as though that was the first time they had heard it. The very um, uh, surprised at uh, things like our academies, um, PBIS, restorative justice, just a myriad of things that she quickly uh, highlighted and emphasized. And I'm hoping that um, we will make, it's about time for us to visit the city council uh, uh, for us to give a brief state of the uh, school district at the city council meeting. And I um, hope that we get there in, and do it very briefly in the same format that we did it, uh, that you did it yesterday. I have attended, um, Vallejo has, has had two football games and I've attended there with their greatest cheerleader, uh, Clarence Isidore. And <laughs> he's uh, full of energy there. And I've also participated, as I've said, the tutoring. Um, let me see. I support a study session on the uh, time of the meeting. Um, Dr. Bishop and I have had several conversations about that, but I also l have r been running kind of a uh, independent uh, survey and uh, observation session in that it's now a little after six and I don't see that many more people in the room. Um, I have attended school board me meetings for many years as president, um, uh, as a parent, I'm sorry, uh, and not a member of the board. And I don't recall us having many more people than we have now. Of course, now uh, hopefully um, that we are uh, are we live now? Uh, yes. So uh, that also, and in this uh, technolo technological age, uh, people are watching us. I think that's very, very, very important. But I am open, to, oh, very open to any discussion that uh, we may have uh, concerning the time of the school board meeting, as long as you know I'm willing to meet with pa um, for parents if they want it at midnight. That would be fine, mm -hmm. but. Um, the main thing is that we get the information out to them, that they're able to see us. We're very accessible to um, the community and to parents. Um, I do want to congratulate um, Linda Kingston, is now the president of the Solano County Athletic uh, Conference, and the vice president is Mr. Clarence Isidore. So I'm very pleased uh, and congratulations to uh, both of our principals. Uh, that concludes my report. Anybody forget anything or anything? Okay. Um, report of the superintendent. Thank you, President Wilson. Um, I just want to briefly mention to um, the board that I will be away on Monday and Wednesday of next week. On the back table, there is an agenda of the California Department of Education training that I'm participating in. Um, I've tended to say we're standing on the cutting edge of a number of things. And um, accompanying the agenda is all of the initiatives that we've embarked upon. And because of those things, I've been asked to serve on the agenda for this training that's a statewide training about how to address the needs of all students, particularly our boys and men of color. So what you'll see on the agenda is that um, Dr. Jeffrey Sprague will open. 
Then it will be handed off to Tom Torlakson and Dr. Robert Ross of the California Endowment. And the endowment has actually visited our schools and is looking to work with us. Then you'll see that Dr. Jeff Duncan Andrade is a presenter. And toward the end is um, your humble superintendent. I, t I tend not to do this. But it's really important that our community know that we're not just talking about how to change our systems, we're actually doing it. And it gives me great pride to represent the district on these two days, Monday and Wednesday. <coughs> and then again, for those who don't understand all that we're doing, we do have a white paper on the back table um, that we are making available. And to partially answer the question about our website, We've given this and other items to a group that is possibly going to be helping us with rebranding, and we'll be sharing more information um, with you at a later time. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the microphone over to our clap capable Director of Audits and Compliance, uh, Ms. Cleo Cheney, who will take you further in understanding more <coughs> about um, our progress towards social media policy. Ms. Cheney. All right. Good evening, Governing Board. After last week, last our last meeting's energetic discussion that we had on social media, Dr. Bishop, being an innovator, immediately brought together a team of individuals, herself, Dr. Shackelford, Deborah Sears, and myself, to try to grapple with this concept of social media and how does it affect the district. So tonight, I'm going to give you an overview. I'm one of those present presenters that I don't look uh, read every slide so I'm going to try to give you a summary view mm -hmm. so as we align the district's social media policy with our core values we had to stop and think where was social media now and then at one time it was a tool mainly for communication but it has evolved to a tool that organizations school districts universities and businesses are using to educate their employees we use it to educate our students and we use it to educate our community it's a tool that is used for advertisement today about your programs, your brand, your sense of goodwill. So how do we take this evolution of social media and look at how it addresses with our current technology? Just today, iPhone has gone out with what is the iPhone 5 and now the iPhone 6. Technology is constantly evolving. Smartphones is a lot more accessible today than it was when I was a younger person. Our users are much younger than they were. I can actually say that my six year old nephew can surf the web quite competently. And that is frightening, but also enlightening. Mm -hmm. And we have a much younger workforce that uses social media as part of their everyday life. So taking all that together, how do we blend this information and concept into an effective policy? So I found an unknown statement here that basically talks about what I just said, how it captivates and that opportunity, but we also much recognize the danger. So who is the district looking at? Who are we looking at here at Vallejo City Unified School District? We must look at our children, we must look at our employees, and we must look at our associated persons. That's our parent groups, our elected leaders, communities, and representatives. We want to take all this information, and when we become, when it's completed, we will not only have a policy, an administrative reg, and we will take this to our use agreements for both employees and our students. So what are the concepts? Next slide. What are the concepts that we're looking at? We want to make sure that we have a policy that has clear guidelines that talks about appropriate and inappropriate activities, that addresses the Children's Internet a Protection Act, and I kind of printed out some information about that that I'll hand out afterwards. And it also helps our employees understand that information that is produced and shared, it has a long range activity during work hours and after work hours. The dangers, it's a misinterpretation and understanding of privacy. When you use this information, when you're using district 
email, there's an assumption of privacy, the danger of familiarity, and a lack of um, clarity when communicating. It's kind of like with um, text messaging today. Our children use text messaging, and so do I, so easily now that sometimes when I write a, a professional email, I have to click my mind off and say I'm in email mode, or you'll carry over with the slang that we use in text messaging. So what are our guidelines? We want to, one, make sure that we define the difference between personal and business. We want to clearly let people know, forward, forward. I know I, I run kind of fast here. <laughs> we want our employees and our social group and our students to understand inappropriate um, conduct and the consequences of using that. We need to make sure they understand when posting um, photographs what you're supposed to do, and it's imperative that when we're doing that, we have consent from our parents. We must clearly understand the district's definition of confidentiality as it relates to our student information. Next slide. We want to make sure that when you're using our social media, there is no expectation of privacy when you are using district property, network, internet, especially our email. We want to be clear with everyone that our social media is not a venue to use threatening, harassing, bullying, derogatory, or disparaging statements about our students, about our employees, or more so about our district. We want to make sure that when you identify yourself on an online that you're acting as an employee and those consequences. And as um, an aunt of several people in the district, I do understand that when I go in to talk to teachers, that when I walk into the room, even though I am in there for a personal nature, I am always representing the district. Next slide, nine. We need to conduct ourselves in accordance with our professional standards. We are looking at that, clearly using district logos and making sure that you have proper approval and not misrepresenting yourself. So in closing, what we're trying to do as we develop this policy, my last slide, which kind of sums it up, we want to make sure that we incorporate the district's values. We value equity, excellence, and educational effectiveness. We want to do this where we are responsible. We protect confidentiality. We are positive role models. We ensure safety for our students and our employees. We respect our audience and we protect our brand. Thank you. Thank you. Good presentation. Uh, at this time, um, we have two cards. I knew Berkey had a card in here. <laughs> uh, Crystal Watts. Good evening, Dr. Bishop, um, President Wilson, Vice President Ubaldi, and board members and community. Um, first of all, I just kind of, the only comment I'm going to make about the earlier tirade um, was that this um, Ms. Sears has my, in, my information. She's welcome to give me a call at any time in regards to the conversation about the confidentiality agreement. Um, I welcome that phone call. So I need to know what this specifically meets for, means for employees. Um, if I have a critical comment in regards to what the district has done, does that mean that I'm in trouble? That I'm gonna get written up because I've criticized the district? Does that follow under derogatory? I think there's some pretty broad words and my concern is, is that if a teacher or somebody who works for the district criticizes publicly the district, are they gonna be written up for that? So I just need some clarification. Um, I wanna know why none of, the, none of the employee groups were part of this, this committee. I think it's really important to have a member from CSEA and a member from VEA 
um, be a part of this, administrators on the team and community members on the team. So I think a VEA person and a CSEA person also needs to be part of this committee. And then my last comment is that um, employees in the district received huge packets. Um, I believe they were board policy packets. And I'm curious, first of all, how many people received these packets and how much money it cost the district. Thank you. Thank you. Berkey World. President Wilson, members of the board, uh, I understand what you're trying to do with a school website and that media that belongs to the school, but I think you might be going a, a step too far. Uh, and item six at the very end, it says any, any website. Well, I think people have the right to say what they want to on other websites that aren't the district's website. You get into the bullying and stuff like that, then that's going to have to be on a case-by-case -case basis. But, I mean, you had a prime example tonight. Citizen got up here and made a disparaging remark about the president of the VEA saying they were, she was incompetent. Uh, that's a disparaging remark by anybody's standards. I know some things I've said up here people have thought have been disparaging. I know some of the things board members have said over the years have been disparaging. So. Again, I understand what you want to do with the district's material, their website, and their email. Any phones that are being paid for by the district are, belong to the district, and that you have control over. But when, when it comes to somebody's personal website or their email, then I think you're coming into a gray area. Uh, I know in years past, I've made some statements at some of our police union meetings about chief of police that's that should be protected we all have the right to say what we want to and, you know there is a, such a thing as the second amendment freedom of speech we need to honor that but we need to have control over district equipment but when it comes to my if i have a personal website uh miss waterman has a personal website that's up to her and i think if we try to police that as a district then i think we're overreaching what we are allowed to do. Everybody has the right to say what they want as long as you don't stand in a crowd and yell fire. Uh, that's against the law. So on the personal side, people, that needs to be done one-on-one. -on -one. I don't think you can set a rule down to where somebody, who, who's going to judge what's a disparaging remark? Was it a disparaging remark to say, hey, if the, if the employees don't like it, I'll pack up your box and walk you out the door? It's individual. So we have to be careful what you want to try and control. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deborah Sears. Good evening again. Thank you, uh, Mr. Worrell. I appreciate your comments. I think we do have to be careful. And I think in our community, we are learning what is appropriate. And we are a very mixed generation here. Um, as uh, Cleo mentioned, our children are very adept at social media, very trusting of things, very, um, it's just part of who they are. Whereas older generations, it's more foreign concept, maybe less trusting, um, you know, there's learning curves, et cetera. So I agree with you, um, Berkey, that we do need guidelines though, and then we need standards about them. Um, to respond to Ms. Watts about why I did not call her directly, because in previous correspondence, she has emailed me, she will never correspond with me any further due to prior conversations we have had. So I feel she is not approachable to, the, you know, to me, or I cannot approach her anymore for discussions. So I bring my comments here, and she can respond to them. So I am talking now, Ms. Watts, and I appreciate you following the standards of our board meeting. Thank you. So, I have posted things on social media websites, VEA Facebook pages, uh, Ms. Watts' Facebook page, and I have been banned from further posts because I guess they were inappropriate or disparaging to them. I thought that was interesting. I was just basically responding back to posts that were disparaging about our school and our s district and our superintendent and all the efforts that we do in here. So we all can have freedom of speech, 
and we can all show our students how to bully each other and not get along, or we can try to partner and de-escalate the conversation and actually, yes, come to the meetings about policies. The VEA and the CSEA should most definitely be at the table. I believe the prior president, Janice Sullivan, had made posts on Ms. Watt's Facebook page before I was banned that said teachers need to get involved in policy. I thought, oh, what a wise woman. And why are they not? I'm a parent. I am very involved in policy because I know that's what sets the tone for this district. I know those are the rules of the road. That is the climate. That is the culture. If you want to lead change, you change policy. So I've been involved in policy for, I don't know, two, three years now. Where have our employees been? Where has Ms. Watts been? Where has any union leader been in policy in our district? It comes to this board meeting as an agenda item. They can read it. They can comment on it. I rarely, if ever, can recall any comments from our union leaders. Interesting. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, Director Waterman. Thank you. We're, we're th um, we've had our community forum? OK. Um, I really want to thank this quick follow-up to our very fruitful and dynamic discussion at our last meeting. Thank you for jumping on that. You're right. This is a movie. The goalposts are constantly moving on this one, I think. But we really do need to you know, get down into the nuances of it. Um, I think that the word disparaging might be a little bit vague, and it should probably be something that we seriously think about, because what we don't want to do is ever make policy that's around restricting someone's freedom of speech. That's not what public meetings are about. Um, and I imagine from all of the uh, study groups that we've done w in regards to ed code and discipline and whatnot, there are plenty of, there's plenty of verbiage and there's plenty of ed code to be able to reference each and every one of these. Um, and it might be wise to say, reference the ed code that this is directly referring to, uh, just to kind of make it that much more um, watertight. Um, and what I see here is at the end of the day, we're, acting, we're asking our adults to model the behavior that we expect to see in our children. And um, maybe making that point in regards to ways in which people can be unpleasant uh, to each other is, uh, is maybe a simple way to go about it. But I really want to say thank you again to the rapid um, response and, and fleshing this out because I think it's really terrific. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? Director Stewart. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to also um, throw caution towards um, overstepping mm -hmm. with some of the language that we um, mm -hmm. place in any policy that we put together. Uh, obviously, we want to make sure that students, staff are um, not being bullied, are, are safe to speak their mind, um, recognizing the difference between personal and district assets. Um, and we just need to walk that line and have the discussion openly and honestly so we come to the right conclusions. There have been other districts that um, thought they were on the right path for putting together social media um, policies and later after um, a closer look was taken, um, had to rework some of those policies. And so um, I'm glad it's in everyone's uh, mind right now, but um, moving too quickly before um, either this either proper legal review or um, discussion and in, um, inform publicly, I think, uh, I think we're um, taking this in, in smaller sample sizes is the way to go. Thanks. I... Um appreciate uh, the discussion and I'm cer certainly I'm sure that this isn't the final product this is an ongoing um, uh, view we want uh, co um, comments from everyone and from every segment I certainly um, do not want to infringe on personal uh, rights and freedom of speech and so um, if um, 
and I, but I stand strong on um, district emails, district property. They belong to the district. And I stand very strong on that. Um, but a, uh, a personal website or whatever, uh, although, uh, you know, if something happens and that it engages the legal, they will look at all those things and you could still find yourself in trouble, even though it is your personal. Uh, so that's personal common sense. Uh, but as far as the district property, the district email, I understand st very strong that we own that and uh, we <coughs> have to <coughs> make sure we have proper policies in place. Um, um, and I want us uh, definitely to have input from everyone on, the, on this uh, policy, just as any other policy. There's uh, no uh, question there. And I'm sure that that is the intent here. Director Ubaldi. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Ms. Cheney, thank you so much for this mm -hmm. uh, report. It's certainly uh, uh, asking us to, to think and rethink about the, uh, uh, I assume this is a process, Madam President, and yes. this is not uh, complete. And, but, but I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, allowing us to reflect on, on a poli po potential policies or that, that it's forthcoming. But I agree fully with uh, President Wilson that the district property should not be used in any way th for personal reason whatsoever. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. I believe that was an information item. Yes. Any other comments? Okay. Not, we'll go on to item 9.1.1, draft education, no uh, specification. Mr. Jordan, this is an information item. Yes, thank you very much. Um, good evening, uh, President Wilson, Vice President uh, Ubaldi, uh, Trustee Stewart, Munson, and Waterman, and uh, Superintendent Dr. Bishop. At this time, I'd like to uh, call your attention to Steve Lane, our director of uh, Long title, facilities, maintenance, operation, and transportation to uh, carry this item for us. Thank you. Thank you, um, President Wilson, Vice President Ubaldi, Board Member Stewart, Mumpson, and Waterman, and Dr. Bishop, and of course, Val. Um, when I kind of get a little more upbeat now and talk about um, the uh, ed ed educational spec where we talk about and put down on paper, how we teach and what we teach. And I'm gonna let uh, Aaron Jobsons of QKA, he's our architect who's doing this. Um, they've worked very hard on it. I participated in quite a few of the meetings. And uh, even in my long years of experience in doing what he's doing, I was impressed. So um, at this time, Aaron, why don't you come up? And we'll have another presentation later about the uh, master plan. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so the, the first piece here today is to talk about the educational specifications. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to give kind of a, a brief overview of what the EdSpec is and, and why we're doing it, and then a little bit of uh, some of the conclusions of that, and then, and then take any questions you might have about the EdSpec. So the, the purpose of the educational specifications is really the first step in the overall master planning process, which I'm going to give a more general update about a couple of items down the agenda. But this first process is really about understanding uh, your educational program and the way you teach and what the facilities needs are to support that educational program. Uh, school facilities have a big impact on student learning and how students uh, work in a space, how teachers work in a space, and we want to make sure that we're providing, as part of this master plan, our goal is to identify what facilities improvements are needed on each, on each school site to meet that educational program and provide that environment for teachers and students to succeed. So uh, the first part of this process is to kind of develop a baseline standard for each type of school, elementary, middle, and high school, as to what facilities are kind of a basic need for meeting the goals of the educational program, meeting all the different initiatives and programs that, that you guys are embarking on. So that, that's the, the overall goal and what we're looking to do with the EdSpec. Uh, we did this by forming an EdSpec committee, which uh, Dr. Bishop was part of, which 
Mel was part of, which a number of other people here in the room were part of, of, of a variety of people across the district staff to represent kind of all different parts of the district, as well as school site principals and a representative from the community as well. And uh, we had four meetings together and really talked through a lot of issues. I think they were productive meetings and uh, really had a good collaborative discussion to come to, to what the conclusions are for what, uh, you know, what those facilities needs are at each site. One of the places we start is just with the overall kind of standards and policies that are in places. That's, that's the kind of the baseline. So that is uh, California Department of Education standards, uh, the Division of the State Architect regulations. So those are the kind of facility standards and, and seismic standards, things like that, that we need to comply with. Uh, your mission goals and values, um, things like other policies that are in place, like the high school academy system, the community schools program, uh, the STEAM plan, technology plan. And then one of the other standards that we look to is something called the Collaborative for High Performance Schools, which is uh, a standard, um, it kind of combines a few different things, but it's essentially a standard that looks at the quality of the educational environment, the physical environment, and standards for things like acoustics and natural ventilation and the amount of air that changes through a space to provide a quality uh, learning environment, but also a sustainable learning environment as well. And so that's something that um, is, provides a good benchmark and a good standard. It's, it's a nationwide standard that was started here in California uh, about, uh, I think, in 2001. So uh, that's something that we use as a, as a benchmark as well. Um, so a few of the things that we talked about, uh, there's kind of a lot of things that apply to all the different schools, and then I'll go over a few things that are specific to the different levels of schools. So the first piece is the, the learning environments. And obviously, uh, classrooms, the, the learning environments themselves, that's a big part of that. And that's where we look to the, those, those collaborative for high-performance school standards. And they talk about things like acoustics, making sure the background noise level isn't too loud, making sure the spaces aren't too reverberant so that obviously it's hard for students to, to learn if they can't hear, and especially younger students or students that are challenged in that area. Uh, indoor air quality is really important. Make sure we have enough fresh air. That can really affect learning as well. Uh, day lighting and lighting, thermal comfort, all these things, if they're not operating properly, are, are kind of stress factors for students, and they just kind of uh, make it harder to learn. We also wanted to make sure we looked at special education spaces and making sure that they were properly designed for what they're used for <laughs> and that they met all the state standards as well and, and that we're matching up programs correctly with facilities across the district. Uh, and then looking to create small group instruction spaces across the district. There are a lot of programs, I think, more and more as we go into more of a 21st century education model where we have pull-out programs where we want people to be able to, uh, students to be able to work in a group in a way that's supervised but maybe a little bit separate from the rest of the classroom. And those kind of spaces are, are, are a good way to be able to do that. And then also looking at um, computer labs. Uh, we had a lot of discussions about technology and kind of where that was going. And, and I think a big part of that discussion was um, understanding that, that we're, we're moving in a direction of maybe someday getting to a point where we can have one-to-one -one computing, but we have technology that we have now that we need to support too, and, and finding the right balance with that and, and making sure that we're providing the infrastructure to grow, but supporting the technology we have now, creating the spaces to meet the requirements for digital testing, things like that, but also looking to the future at the same time. Um, and then also on the topic of technology, wanting to make sure that we have AV systems in all the, all the classrooms. Um, for all these things, our goal with this process isn't to solve these problems for each school site. That's going to be the, the, the goal of the master planning process, which is kind of the next step for this. This was to kind of develop a benchmark for all the schools to be compared against so that we have equity across, across the whole district. Um, another issue that we talked quite a bit about was security and just campus security and safety in general and had a lot of conversations about that. It's probably the thing we talked about the most, I'd say, if, if, if there was one thing. Uh, and, and I think that starts with having a secure perimeter to the school so that we are controlling who's coming on and off the campus during the school day. And, and that's a really important thing. So that's something that we want to establish from the beginning. Uh, but at the same time, we want to make sure we maintain access to community uh, use areas like fields and playgrounds after school hours. So there's kind of a balance there and, and just kind of a, an approach to how we fence the perimeter of a campus. Um, also recognizing the, the ongoing programs the district has to put video surveillance in place, to put uh, fire and intrusion alarms in place, and to put upgrade the communication systems too. Those are all kind of part of the overall uh, security of a campus. Another big piece was the connection to the community uh, with the community schools program, but just in general schools or community institutions and how they relate to the community is a big thing. Uh, making Doing things to just improve uh, what we called the campus visual experience or the curb appeal of the, of the campuses and then kind of have a, a welcoming presence, have a clear sense of entry so that 
um, visitors know where to go when they approach a school and where the, where the office is and that they really need to go through the office to get onto the campus and that's an important part of security as well. Um, some of the other site features looking at safe and efficient parking and drop off. Uh, you know, most of your schools were designed at a time where it wasn't common for parents to drop their kids off at school, but that's changed. And so that's something that we want to look at too and make sure that as much as possible we can provide safe places for parents to drop off their kids where kids don't have to cross in front of traffic, where, uh, you know, bus traffic is separated from cars and students and all those things. Provide staff parking off the street where we can. Um, that's not going to be possible at all your sites, but I think that's, that's a goal that we'd like to look at as we look at each one. And then uh, safe, accessible, supervisable playgrounds and sports fields and, uh, and creating outdoor learning areas too. I think a, a big part of uh, thinking about you know, education in the 21st century way too is being able to go outside, uh, being able to, to you know, involve nature in the curriculum, being able to have small groups go outside and have that supervision too. And uh, creating school gardens or at least creating the opportunity for school gardens at each site and that becomes kind of an individual school community program but having the, the infrastructure and the, and the support for that. Um, in the uh, administration area of the campus that needs to be part of the um, kind of setting the standard to have that as part of that sense of entry but also part of that security control system so that every visitor during the school day has to come through the administration to come onto the campus. Um, having you know all the requisite office spaces that we need for everything also having meeting spaces that can be used as teacher collaboration spaces for IEP meetings, but also for all the different kinds of programs that the community schools program is going to bring on to your school sites as well. And uh, so that kind of covers those things really apply to all your schools. They'll apply a little bit differently to each school, a little bit differently to each type of school. Uh, for elementary schools, uh, a couple of things we talked about as well, having a, a STEAM lab on each campus, which would be kind of a large flexible learning space. Um, sometimes we'll even call these kind of like wet and dirty classrooms where they're, they, you know, they have resilient hard surfaces, they have sinks, so you can use them to do science projects or art projects or any of those sorts of things and that's exactly what the STEAM program is. And so creating one of those on every elementary school, um, having a library in every elementary school that serves as that kind of flexible collaborative learning space, uh, you know, a place to access resources and information whether it be in books or online or digitally. And, uh, and be that kind of heart of the campus and having a, you know, a functional multi-use room on each campus that provides a warming kitchen that has you know, a decent amount of space for, for students to eat lunch, but also for performances, for activities that supports PE and that has kind of a stage and AV system as part of that too. Um, at middle schools, the STEAM program gets a little bigger and we have two labs of two different sizes with slightly different capabilities. Um, to, to meet the different requirements or different kinds of uh, spaces that can be used, different kinds of programs. Uh, again, a library too is an important part of a middle school, but it's, it's a little bit bigger facility, having a, a computer lab and a classroom space adjacent to it so it can be a more flexible space where classes can come in and use it at the same time that students are using it independently. Having performing art spaces on each uh, middle school campus, which would include music instruction and a, a performing arts kind of auditorium space. And then, of course, gymnasiums and locker rooms. At the high school level, uh, it, it gets a bit different because the, the academy program comes into play. And that's obviously different for each of the two high schools. They have different academies. But the overall theme is that each academy could kind of have a sense of place on campus and, and a kind of um, you know, place that belongs to itself that feels like, a, and, you know, that feels like a space for that academy. Uh, have a small administrative area on that campus as well that houses the, the sort of administrative piece of the campus that's associated with that academy. Um, have facilities that are, you know, provide the infrastructure for that, that subject matter of that academy. And, uh, and have a space for student presentations as well as that's a big part of the academy program. Um, having, you know, the requisite athletic facilities at each school. Uh, and then a library, you know, standards for the library there as well for group work, for presentations, for, for small collaborative work, for study groups and things like that, being able to accommodate those in the library. And then also a college and career center and having that being really centrally located on the campus and really accessible to students, really visible to students and to parents. And it needs to be accessible to parents too. And so that, that's an important part of, important and kind of unique part of the high school. Uh, and so that's kind of a little bit of a, a summary and um, hopefully that wasn't too much detail. But from here, we, we'll take this document and we've, we've as, as I'll go over in a minute, but this kind of becomes the standard where the kind of the starting place as we go into master planning meetings with, with committees at each of the school sites. So if the board has any questions.
Director Waterman. <laughs> Ladies first. That's thank right. you, President Wilson. You're welcome. Um, first of all, thank you. This is very comprehensive. And thank you. there is something extremely satisfying about seeing all of the work that we have done as activists and parents and electeds and staff, all of the visions that we've seen for our children, all these little tiny things that we put into place, come together with this holistic benchmark piece. Um, it's extremely satisfying, and I thank you very much for the work that you did. Thank you. I'm excited about the outdoor learning spaces. I think that's terrific. I didn't know about the collaborative learning benchmark that you mentioned, but it makes absolute perfect sense. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you're going to be looking into air, functionally like air cross ventilation, natural mm -hmm. lighting, acoustics, huge. I mean, I know we all, ha we all know that multi-purpose room, whichever one it is in our lives, that it's a din to be in, whether there's 10 kids or 10,000, it seems like 10,000 children. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really very grateful that that's part of what we're looking at with this, because you're right, all of those things are stressors and they, they can wear out, they can wear down some, some kids. Mm -hmm. um, I love the, um, well, I love a lot of it, but I just wanted to make mention of the school garden as a concept, of course. We have a number of go-getter schools already who are really invested in helping create them. I know that it's going to be tricky. We'll, we will have to figure out in, the, in real life ultimately how they're cared for because, of course, the big growing season is during the summer when mm -hmm. most of us are not there. So, But that's, that's something we'll have to tackle when it, when it comes right down to it, and perhaps we'll think of something really innovative. Got any ideas? <laughs> it's always always a tough challenge for, for school. I yeah, mean, it, yeah. It really comes down to the being a community. The community buy-in, right. Mm -hmm. And I think that our community schools' efforts will help facilitate some of that. It won't just be on the shoulders of the parents, you know, mm -hmm. or the guardians, or even the teachers who are committed to the garden, but our neighbors, the people who are watching our children walk to and from school, uh, we invite them onto the campus to help be a part of this, and it can, you know, develop a really strong sense of community. So with that, I am, um, again, very happy to read this. It seems totally right on, and uh, I'm excited about it. Thank you. Thank you. Director Stewart. Thank you. And thank you for being here this evening to present I'm, I'm taking a look um, at the acknowledgments in the beginning and curious um, when um, you had an opportunity to visit various school sites mm -hmm. um, to do um, assessment. Uh, that work, which kind of followed after uh, the, the, the committee meetings, at least, of producing this document, uh, was over the summer. So, um, and I'll go over that a little bit later when I give the update, but essentially our staff has been to all of the school sites now with, with QKA and also with Van Pelt Construction Services as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we're collaborating together on this and, and over the summer we were able to visit really uh, every room of every one of your schools. So uh, that's, some, that's, that's kind of the next piece of this kind of goes right along with what are the program needs, what are your physical needs. Uh, to what degree were you able to um, assess um, the um, functionality of existing facilities and, and determine what can be built upon or what has to be scrapped and more or less started over and um, a different approach. Yeah, and I think um, these are all kind of pieces of that bigger puzzle. Mm -hmm. So a piece of that is what is the physical condition of it? A piece of that is uh, how does it meet these ed specs? A piece of that is gonna be what do we hear from that school community? Uh, you know, how do they feel that school is working for them? Mm -hmm. What are those needs? And then a piece of that is going to be a financial calculation, too. And after we kind of figure out our, you know, master plan and that list of improvements we'd like to see to the campus, then we need to cost estimate those. And, and, and that's where Mark has a lot of work to do. And coming up with those costs and then figure out, all right, what's the, what's the cost benefit to replacement <coughs> versus, versus repair and modernization? And, and that's kind of all part of uh, putting this whole recipe together to make that total master plan at the end. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Um, I, I completely understand um, taking the time during the summer to mm -hmm. go from site to site, classroom to classroom, hallway to hallway, um, to be efficient with time, um, but uh, want to uh, acknowledge the value that's 
involved with being there when the students are there as well mm-hmm. and understanding the way the schools flow um, mm-hmm. understanding the way the classrooms work talking with staff and understanding um, how it all works in the real world not necessarily just on the layout side of it yeah. and I'm, I'm just making that comment just in in general for the sake of um, theory and, and application mm-hmm. um, the other big issue obviously when we're talking about um, upgrading and, and what's what are the needs is protecting our assets mm-hmm. and making sure that what we do invest and, and, and do uh, put in place can um, live through its useful life because mm-hmm. it's still there um, to what degree did that work um, coordinate with um, current initiatives by the district and maybe Mel perhaps you can jump in with other um, uh, other work being done on a collaborative level between the school district and say through the interagency <coughs> committee in the city okay thank you um, one of the most important things here is that we are in a good place um, with the community back um, when we did the original uh, modernization put in an infrastructure that is sustainable through time. Um, That's from the power and the technology infrastructure. Um, We do have areas that are obviously, as anyone's home, reaches a life cycle um, of things, such as, you know, our heating and air conditioning units. You know, we're reaching that 20-year period where everyone in their household needs to be very aware of what that's about. We um, basically, through the first round, Um, did not address certain areas because it still had a life expectancy such as the plumbing which is under the ground and things like that so again those things are uh, being paid attention to this this time around so that we can build on what we've already um, have had in place the um, things that uh, obviously you know as technology moves along and how environments change and as programs sort of get uh, more customized to meet the needs of today that's where a lot of the uh, educational specifications comes in about what those spaces look like what they feel like and how we integrate with them so again we we are um, in line and again when uh, when we in when we get um, uh, again when we get more into um, conversation after this next phase fa- this next phase as well as um, uh, letting the community know the amount of uh, uh, how much work we are paying attention to to basically be able to sustain ourselves through time um, and as we prepare for ourselves for obviously um, the bond that we're looking for in uh, uh, in, uh, June of next year is that we want to make sure that the community knows how committed we are. We we want to protect the investments that we've had um, 20 years ago and as we are trying (coughs) to build upon those for the next next (coughs) round of years to come. Yeah, thank you for that update. You know, part of it also, I'm curious, um, going through this process, this is very comprehensive, um, but to what degree are we looking at, um, and you brought up this word a few times, um, sustainable um, assets, you know, things that are not planned obsolescence, but Mm -hmm. something that we can see be useful for many years to come because it's not necessarily um, a technological uh, piece that will be obsolete by just the growth of technology, but something yeah. more along the lines of um, whether it's lighting or, or just design that's um, more efficient and, and sustainable. To what degree does that play a part? Uh, yeah, I think in a, in a number of ways. I think whenever we look at improvements, we try to really look at things um, from that perspective of, of lasting a long time. I mean, we, you're not going to get a lot of opportunities to improve your school, so we need to make sure that we use every dollar as the best as possible and make sure that lasts a long time. And I think that comes through, you know, in the type of materials that we choose and the actual durability of things. I think another piece of that, too, is designing for flexibility and, uh, you know, making sure that we're designing spaces. As much as we know about how we're teaching now and how we're going to teach in the near future, I don't think anyone could say they know how it's going to work in 2040. And these school buildings still need to be here then. And so thinking about how things can be flexible for that. And, and, you know, you have a lot of schools that I think will lend themselves to adapting themselves well. 
um, that, that are flexible. Uh, thinking about that and then sort of the other aspect of sustainability is looking at, you know, being energy efficient, making sure that we're reducing that cost to the district and you can put that money into students and, and thinking about those things too and that's a big part of what we do too. That's one of the reasons we reference the, the collaborative for high performance schools thing because that's a big part of that program and that becomes kind of a good guideline for us to use for all those sorts of things but it has a big piece of energy efficiency as well and that's something we'll look about. It's something you guys have already done a really good job of as well with the with, um, I always forget what they changed their name to, but the energy education program and, and really looking at the, you know, the energy plan that you guys have and, and making sure to be efficient about how you use energy and, and also the improvements that were done under Measure A. I think you know, a lot of the lighting systems, electrical systems and things like that were upgraded. And uh, you know, there, there, a lot of that work as we went through uh, is really in pretty good shape and a lot of that infrastructure is there and we won't need to do a lot of those things. There are some things that are worn out like mechanical units, like flooring, you know, things that just have a have a time that they wear out but those are pretty easy to replace too they don't require uh, it's replacing a piece of equipment it's not remodeling and you know tearing apart a whole building and putting it back together okay um, my final comment it might is probably again for you Mel and it has to do with um, our ability to identify and update um, our working drawings for our sites through this process um, there's been some discussion about to what degree we know where everything is, so to speak. And um, to what degree is there a, a, a part of this process that includes um, updating, um, whether it be um, a utility plan or, or something along the lines of knowing and, and diagramming where um, the, the various um, utilities are or other assets on the site um, or is that not a component in, in no it's something it's that would be on the side excellent uh, it's always um, something we build upon when we first started this back um, in uh, 1997 um, there were ancient drawings um, and which basically were called ie as built drawings mm -hmm. but that's what they were, you know, in a sense of what they call as built, where they weren't really what as is, you know, uh, when you actually get into the work. Through the process that we did with modernization, um, we, you know, you got to another level of technology which had a lot more ways of making sure that <coughs> we ensured documentation was pretty accurate. So our drawings are pretty accurate for what we knew at the time. So each, each time you touch a building or each time you're building something, you you add more information into what you have. Um, again, um, we did not get into a lot. There were some um, unknowns within the building that we now know um, are on our drawings. We have that clearly noted. But we're going to be going into the ground a little bit more this time around. Um, hopefully, you know, we'll be doing it in a way that um, will um, uh, provide ways that we do um, um, surveying. Um, in a way that before we actually get into the actual contract work is that we do um, survey work, which is an added cost, but at the end of the day, that survey work ends up being a cost-effective way because we're not ending up doing it when we're into construction. So again, it's always a challenge. We have documents, though, that um, are only uh, less than uh, 20 years old, so we, we pretty much have some pretty good information. It's just a matter of that um, lessons learned is that we, we, in, we infuse um, um, a portion of work we, we do survey work before we actually start construction and I would I would say you know we work with a lot of school districts and and record drawings are often a problem but you guys have done a really good job of keeping those organized and and you know uh, the, the, the room that you have for the drawings we're able to find pretty much anything we need within there without too much trouble and so that's that's been really helpful for us as we you know embark on this really high level master planning process where we're not uh, you know, as you said, we're going to get into the details of that when we actually start doing projects and doing surveys and making sure everything is exactly right. But the level of information that we need now just to make sure at a high level things are, we understand how the site works, we're able to access pretty easily. Thank you both and look forward to the next steps. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Director Ubaldi. I too appreciate the presentation and the care that uh, you have given to to invite us to uh, review and participate. Thank you. And um, and I like the approach of looking at the users 
and how they, they, the facility impacts uh, them. And I, I like the words that was used earlier by Trustee Waterman and uh, Trustee Stewart in regards to the holistic and comprehensive approach. And, uh, and, and the other thing also, you, you did not take uh, a lot of assumptions that many of us who sometimes write and talk about the goals and values, but you actually stipulate, describe what they are and, and describe the particular, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what a wall to wall academy is and what STEAM is. And, and so it was very inviting rather than, you know, uh, uh, just making assumptions that we know those particular things. And I, I really appreciate that, the care that's given by, by your, uh, the, the, the write-ups and the uh, preparation. The question, I, two questions I have is that uh, are, you, you mentioned that there are staff who have been involved. Mm -hmm. uh, are there parents who have been invited to participate or is that part of the journey? in uh, developing the, the master plan. That That's will one. be, um, we did have one community representative as part of the EdSpec uh, committee, uh -huh. but that the involvement of community and parents is, okay. is part of the, the master plan meetings, which I'll, I'll go over a little bit in the, the second kind of okay. piece of the presentation. But yeah, that, that's really where that comes in. This is kind of just a, uh, establishing the policy and the benchmark and then how that gets implemented at each site mm -hmm. is, uh, is really something that we involve the whole school community in, which when, when I say that, I mean, you know, Parents, teachers, staff, uh, principal, okay. the district, neighbors, um, you know, the, everyone that's involved in that school. Okay. The second one is that, uh, and I don't know if, if this is uh, Mel's uh, uh, respond to this question, and that is, th this is really um, a journey to, in preparation for the school bond, that this gives flesh to the idea that we need to improve on a modernization and improve our facility. But I sense, I sense this is really adding uh, a flash to that particular goal. Yeah, th yeah it is. It's establishing um, a high, well, basically communications to the entire community about the accountability that we are applying. Okay. And it's extremely important to, and we made decisions, the board made decisions um, uh, a few months ago as to taking the time to do it right. And so, okay. Uh, the message that's going to be uh, shared, and I hope that you know those that are listening, and those that are here understand this journey. This journey is one that is uh, a collectively journey for everyone to participate and everyone to engage themselves to pr uh, basically to protect the assets that we have and to bi and protect uh, and build upon our future. So yes, this is this is a means to establish a high level of communication and continued communication to the entire community as to what the effort is and uh, because we do care and we want this to work. Wow. Uh, I've been involved in many uh, bonds, Sacramento, El Grove, and San Francisco and here, and I've never seen any that type of preparation to clarify the goals that we're trying to achieve, and we really ap I really appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry, I turned it off rather than on. I'm very pleased um, to see the detail concerning safety, uh, uh, surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. And let me see, it's what time? Seven o'clock, and there are fewer people here. Mr. Suskell is gone. <laughs> so uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, uh, very interested in um, uh, <laughs> the um, safety of the students, safety of the faculty, safety on our campuses. And I really liked um, the infusion of the full service community schools, the academies, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this document will be very valuable mm -hmm. as we move forward. Um, uh, and as the grand jury continues to look at us, and um, this obviously was in place well before that uh, uh, report came out. So it does show that we have a focus on safety. We have a focus on full service community um, and, and uh, the academies. 
and that we want our schools, our buildings, our facilities to support those activities. Um, I do have a question. Where, how will our unions be involved, our uh, employee groups, mm -hmm. in this process? Oh, my goodness. Sorry. Um, much like the, the parents at the master planning meetings, uh, mm -hmm. we, we put together committees that, that represent that entire school community, and that includes you know, teachers, classified staff, Mm -hmm. and, and the community at each of the sites where we did the, the assessments and we went to each school, mm -hmm. uh, we made a point whenever possible to talk to the head custodian as soon as we got there, have them walk us around and show us the areas that they know are issues, make sure we kind of capture that input as much as possible. And then uh, we kind of did some preliminary analysis too where we met with uh, various members of the maintenance team and, and talked to them about, uh, you know, the, met with the plumbing guys and, and what are the plumbing issues across the district and that kind of thing. So we've had some involved, some of that involvement already and some of that will come through the master planning process mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I hope we look closely at is um, our uh, locks, mm -hmm. um, whether we go to a court um, um, system so that, um, uh, and so we can change them frequently. Um, accesses and that there's access uh, to the entire building for safety reasons whether we need to get in or get out mm -hmm. uh, so I hope that we look at car keys however whatever process uh, other than a uh, normal keying system because then if a key is lost a master key is lost if you have the card key system then the technology allows you to record at a much cheaper rate than rekeying a whole school. So I hope that we're looking at all that. Um, let me see, I, do I have a any other comments by board members? Um, Deborah Sears. Good evening again. Just to be clear, we're talking about the Ed Spec, the big 105 pages. Okay. So um, I, I also very much appreciate the document. I was like, wow, it's a, like our whole, it's a book about our schools, our district. It's lovely. Um, I, I love the garden insertions there and all the references to all the good things we're doing. Um, just a little t comment about the garden. It is a, a very, it's just a, it's a community builder. I, all summer I watched our garden at Mare Island. We kind of had some you know, rough starts for a couple of years with ours, but um, we really committed. It took my family, a teacher, and a couple other families and students, and we just sort of informally, whoever passed by that day, was the dirt dry or not, and let's water, let's not, let's harvest. It initiates conversations. I have more people come up to me while I'm in that garden. Oh, what is this, a school? Wow, this is so cool. Every class has contributed to that garden, whether it's been an art piece or planting or watering or harvesting. It's, it's a place that everybody respects. It's just beautiful. So love the garden thing. So Ed Speck, a um, couple of questions really, and I, I think I'm going to my, my master planning meeting on Monday, so maybe some of this will be answered but I just wanna do my homework tonight and make sure I'm ready. Um, in the introduction on EdSpec, it talks about elementary, middle, high schools, and K through eight. Yet in the district-wide standards, I see elementary, middle, and high school. I don't see K through eight, so I'm wondering, should I just consider myself elementary and middle? Or is there a K through eight slot that's specific to a district-wide standard or not? Um, so some clarification would be great, because I know we always say we have STEAM at all our middle schools. Well, does that include our K through eight? Because we only have really one math science teacher <laughs> at our, well, in our sixth grade. I mean, I guess we have three, but you know, how are they integrated into the STEAM, and is the STEAM lab going to happen at our K through eight? So I'm sure you're expecting all of that. Uh, technology. I think I read a sense about we're looking at the near term because it's hard to predict the long term. Um, I like the word sustainable. Let's prepare for something that's sustainable. Uh, define adequate main connection. The word adequate, a little vague, maybe appropriate, maybe according to science tech standards of today or in the future. I know there's standards out there for internet stuff. so. You just, there's, I'm, I would hope you know how to connect to that. <laughs> um, 
the, and then how do we support continued growth? And is it really impossible for anyone to know the future of our technology? I mean, could we consult with AT&T, Apple, Microsoft? What's on their R&D plane? You know, we'll keep it proprietary. We just don't want to waste our bond money building something. I'm out of time. No, we need <laughs> oh. a little bit more. <laughs> the other question was, um, you know, look at movies. That's some ideas. Talk to students about what they think their future holds for technology. What do they want to see? I bet we get some creative stuff out there. I'm sure my son will give you some ideas. Um, plumbing in classrooms. I know my, my second grader is in a module with no sink and no water fountain. I know there might be some reason why, but going into our plan, I didn't see plumbing kind of addressed in classrooms, so I, I didn't know if that's just not appropriate. It did say kindergartens will have restrooms accessible from the classroom, so does that mean a bathroom in the classroom or just around the corner? Um, at a health and fitness academy, also, maybe environmental science academy and you know our hospitality. Do can we have a full kitchen? You know, cooking all the time at a health and fitness academy sounds kind of like makes it sense, right? So um, our kitchen. I know we talk about warming kitchens, but nutrition is part of the holistic approach we're taking at our school. And to be able to go from garden to kitchen to you know that full service type of thing would be wonderful. Um, and it fits with our mission. So um, anyway, those were some of the questions. And since this is a draft, it, I presume it could be adjusted or tweaked according to accommodate that. Thank you for listening again. Appreciate it. Thank you for your comments. Any other questions, comments? Thank you so much. Excellent presentation and very informative. Thank you. That was not an action, that was an information item. Um, item 10.1, personnel actions. Director Waterman. Good Thank evening. You. Hi, Gigi. Hello. Uh, so I see a number of teacher appointments here, and I've certainly been getting a lot of um, communications of concern from, uh, from uh, teachers with overages in their classroom. I'm wondering if this is an example of our attempt at uh, dealing with some of our overages in our classroom and, and where we are with that. I'll take that one. Um, we are in constant communication around overages. Um, and one of the things that I'd just like to state up front is that with regard to middle and high schools, that's where the complexity comes around overages uh, because of the complexity of a master schedule concept. And so tomorrow we have an intensive meeting to go through all of our overages, not to say we haven't been doing things in the past, um, but things like we've added zero and seventh period for credit recovery. So that's reflected in some of the numbers that teachers have. We have uh, students that are taking cyber high courses and therefore they're not really in the classroom they just have to be reflected with a teacher so we have those kinds of complex issues that we're working through and we have some issues with regard to our middle school and um, some of the uh, configurations of our classes that we're also working through that's not to say we do not have some more hiring to do we've done a great deal with regard to K through 3 um, you remember in our LCFF presentation that we're back to quantifying how far we can get to 24 to 1. And so we've done hiring there. We had some issues with regard to life circumstances with some of our teachers that caught us by surprise at the beginning of the year. So we've had substitutes in those regards. And so it's all very complex. But with regard to the work that is going on, we are all working together in a district team to address those overages because we do not want class sizes over the amount that they are supposed to be. In addition, I just want to commend up front Dr. Future Dr. Patrick, who is working on her doctorate. Um, Thank you. <laughs> for all of the great work that she's been doing because I'm telling you that HR has been busy. And so we appreciate you wholeheartedly, <laughs> Future Dr. Patrick, as well as um, Eleanor 
uh, Bruton, who also has been working very hard in human resources. Yes, thank you, Gigi. It's thank true. You. I can see that human resources is thriving under your care. So thank you. And thank you, Dr. Bishop, for the clarification. Director Ubaldi. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I see here uh, Philip Shelley, Director of School Management and Support, Academic Services. I read that very well, but I don't know what it means. But is it what's what's the job description? What's the uh, uh, responsibility and and portfolio, et cetera? Could someone take the time to tell me about that particular Surely. position, please? I'm not sure if Mr. Shelley is still in the room. He's is uh, he? outside talking to Ms. Please. Um, or I consulting, I should say. I would say that um, you know that Mr. Santos has accepted, um, for he, former Director Santos has accepted a position in another school district. We therefore had the opportunity to recraft a job description that basically allows for um, an individual be to be the primary contact for the management of our schools, which is much different than the curriculum and instruction arm of our schools. This is simply the management of our schools, which could deal with safety issues, could deal with suspension expulsion issues, those types of things. And when it comes to um, Director Shelley. Um, I have to say that I sat in actually on every single interview because of the key, the very important role that this is. I wanted to see all the candidates. And we had several external candidates and um, a couple internal candidates. And when I tell you that this young man far outclassed any <coughs> candidate I'm telling you, it was amazing. And so our schools will be in great care. This is the individual that our principals will call if they have X happening on campus that's inexplicable. And already in his role as a coordinator, Mr. Shelley was out and about. We could never find him here. He's always on the school campuses. So this is a natural fit. What adds to his role will be evaluating our principals and having served at a school site as an administrator for so long he really gets it and he's been able to plug in immediately and so we are truly 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 uh, very happy to have mr. Shelley as our new director and while I have the mic if I could just take personal privilege and acknowledge a couple people who have moved on from us, but we never want to hold anybody back if they see opportunity for growth in their career. So on the second page of this document, you'll see that Christine McGifford, who is our Administrative Assistant Confidential Human Resources, she's moving on, and it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And she's gonna be making more money and having more responsibility. Mm -hmm. And she'll be working for the California Teachers Association. <laughs> so she has um, understanding mm -hmm. of that whole piece and we're very excited for her. Mm -hmm. And in addition, um, we're excited for Anthony Ryans. You'll know him as the after school coordinator for Cooper. Mm -hmm. And if you have witnessed everything, Lance is nodding his head then you know this is, this is a young man that puts on plays. The last thing I attended was a 50-minute play mm -hmm. complete with dancing, oh, singing. I mean, students who general. had memorized. Mm -hmm. This is an outstanding young man. Mm -hmm. And GVRD has snatched him. I have a conversation I need to schedule with Mr. McAfee because I'm mm -hmm. not happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but he's moving on to GVRD mm -hmm. to accept more responsibility as well. So I definitely want to appreciate every individual on this roster, whether they're coming into our district or going out, because in many cases they're going on to greater and better things or moving up to greater and better things, which includes Mr. Shelley. Thank you. Well, I- uh, Madam uh, President, oh, I'm, I, I, right. I'm not through, ma'am. Okay, go right ahead. So, uh, Although I may but take the floor from you. No, but <laughs> <laughs> go you right could, ahead. You could. <laughs> go right ahead. Uh, the question I have, is this a promotion? Yes, it is. 
Oh, why, why didn't you say so? <laughs> That's something to celebrate. Yes, it is. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations, Mr. Shelley. Thank you. That's, um, that's all the comment I really wanted to make. Well Thank I you, wanna, Madam President. I am going to comment on, uh, I wasn't confused that it was a promotion. I, just, I was more confused on the name, Philip. Because, see, uh -oh. I've known <laughs> Philip since he was in high school, and his name is Wu. Uh, we all call him Wu, Shelley. And we, and we used to put Philip down. I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> Congratulations, Wu. <laughs> Director Stewart. Thank you. Uh, I want to piggyback on the uh, comments made by uh, Trustee Waterman and um, know what our strategy is for um, addressing the overages at this stage in the school year when it may not always be the easiest situation to find the best and brightest um, it, be, it can become a challenge and so therefore are we in a position to reach out <coughs> to our retired teachers are we able to look at um, other options um, that may be in um, a private setting what is our strategy at this stage because um, I wanted to let it be known as well um, the overages were a theme at some of the back to school um, events that I attended. So we're doing a variety of different things. Um, we do, we are, we have posted vacancies and we're advertising and we're hiring teachers weekly. We also have, we are utilizing um, our relationships with various colleges and universities and credentialing programs. So we also are hiring interns. So we have quite a few interns and we have had interns that are um, HQT compliant. Um, we are also using our retirees um, who have certain stipulations. They can only work 40, a, a certain amount of the school year so they can't fully take a position unless it's a part-time position or unless they come out of retirement. But the way we typically use them is through our subsystem because our retirees are fully credentialed. And so if there is a long-term vacancy or a long-term absence of a teacher, we try to place someone in the classroom that's fully credentialed. We're very thoughtful about who we're bringing into our system as well as how we utilize the resources that are available to us. Right now we have um, MOUs with several colleges and universities and credentialing programs and so that allows us to be able to use their interns um, and teachers from their programs. And we are actively recruiting um, and we are actively utilizing their services. For example, last night we had principals who interviewed several teachers who were recommended for hire. So there's still viable candidates out there. Yes, it is late in the year, but one of the beautiful things about education is that students are constantly coming into programs at different phases of their lives. They don't always start in September and end in May and June. They start at different times, they end at different times. And so we've been very fortunate to um, be able to get some of those new folks who are coming into education. So we, we are filling the vacancies and you will continue to see um, at every board meeting a list of teachers and classified staff because we're working to fill as many vacancies as possible. Thank you for that and I, thank you. And I would also hope that um, through this process, the same new teachers that we were supporting at school sites, as was mentioned earlier, as an example at Vallejo High School with a lot of new staff, the mentoring, the, the showing of um, the ways and means that we go about um, in our school district, that we would put the same energy and effort, if not more, to these individuals who come in midstream just because you are in the middle of the year and you will need to catch on right away and um, there are certainly some challenges associated with that. So just wanted to uh, address that and get an update on where we are. Thank you. Yes, that is, those practices are being duplicated at all of our sites, so thank you. Any other 
sorry. Any other questions, comments? If not, we uh, thank you, future Dr. Patrick. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> Ten point two uh, facilities master plan presentation. This is a um, information item. Again, Steve. Hello again, President Wilson and board members, Dr. Bishop. Um, just want to kind of piggyback on some of the things that were coming up on the uh, EdSpec thing. A lot of those were kind of master plan related. The uh, maintenance staff was, was, has already been heavily involved in the uh, initial reviews. The guys with their hands on the pipes, in the machines, on the roofs, finding the termites, all those fun things, um, were, were really involved in the early stages. And they will be involved in phases when we, even when we get beyond the master plan into the working drawings onto, um, you know, onto that phases. Um, we have guys who talking about, Mel was talking about the uh, as-built drawings. Some of the guys we have have been around for those 20 years and they seem to know that that switch turns on that light in that other room. Things like that that really aren't shown on the plan. So they're gonna be heavily involved so that we avoid the, the pitfalls that come with that. So, and again, as in my, my past life, I, I understand the uh, importance of that and we'll be heavily involved in that. And this is getting into my wheelhouse now, so I'm really excited about where we're going with this. Um, Aaron and uh, Mark are gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, the master plan and the process that goes through with that. This is where the rubber, rubber meets the road. <clears throat> Um, the hard decisions start being made. The priorities become really, really important. You know, we've got to get these buildings standing up firmly, and then we have to look at starting to how we're going to make them work with our, with our educational specs. So there's a lot of work to do, and we have a lot of meetings coming up. And I appreciate that you're going to be at our meeting Monday. Um, really important that I um, encourage the public to please come to those meetings. Teachers, um, CSE, CSEA. Um, really important and there there's a lot of work to do we have dozens and dozens of meetings coming up and I'll be at hopefully all of them so anyway thank you come on up Aaron and Mark thank you. if you do the view full screen on that it'll work just like a slideshow I don't know if you can but it'll look uh, you okay don't worry about it <laughs> um, so this is just to kind of follow up uh, on what we talked about before so next slide uh, to give kind of an overview of, if you <coughs> there, that'll work, yeah. Uh, the master planning process as a whole and, and sort of what we're embarking on, the first step of that is the educational specifications, which uh, we talked about plenty already. Uh, the next step of that is the facilities assessment, and that's um, the, the boots on the ground, looking at each site, really looking at the condition of your physical plant. Uh, ah, thank you. Uh, the next piece after that is master planning. And what we, what we mean by that is as really involving each school community in that process and really listening to them and getting their input and understanding what they need and, and using their knowledge of the site to help us understand what's going on. And then, uh, and then we kind of pull all that together into a comprehensive plan and vision for each school and, and kind of a plan on how we're gonna implement that as well. And then the last piece of that is community outreach and really getting this plan out into the community, making sure that everyone knows or as many people as we can reach know, uh, know what's going on, know what uh, we've done, the process that we've gone through, what we've considered and, and where, uh, where the district is going with their facilities. Uh, so we talked a lot about the ed specs already. I, I think it covered that. Uh, facilities assessment needs. So what, what this, uh, over the summer, um, uh, our team and, and Mark's team together uh, we visited every one of your 25 school sites. Uh, we actually went and, and looked at and photographed pretty much every room on every school. So uh, obviously that was a lot of work and, and something that we spent most of the summer doing. And uh, the goal there is really to understand, again, the physical plant and look at, you know, do the floors need to be replaced? How is the roof doing? Uh, what, um, you, know, it, you know, how are the acoustics in this room? How are the acoustics in that room? What is the lighting condition like? What is the day lighting like? What are, what are all these things like in every, in every classroom space and all the other spaces on each campus? Uh, and then we use that to create a comprehensive list of the facility's needs and sort of uh, identifying each need and then the proposed improvement to remedy that need. And we kind of start with a list that we make based on our assessment and then we'll add to that, we'll modify that as we hear from each school community and then and that results in a, in a comprehensive list at the end. Uh, so kind of a few things just to highlight what we found uh, in the work that we've done so far in looking at all your schools. 
first thing is that a lot of the improvements from Measure A uh, that Mel talked about before and, and that Mark worked on as well have uh, held up really well. There was a lot of work there done to really do an intensive modernization of, of all, most, if not all, of your school spaces and really kind of tear them down to the studs and rebuild them in new electrical infrastructure and data infrastructure. And a lot of that is, is really doing pretty well. Um, the some of the ceiling, uh, the, you know, the walls, your ceiling finishes, your cabinetry, your lighting, those are all in pretty good shape. We're not going to have to do a lot of work there. We may do some minor things like lighting controls and some of those other things that you can do a lot more wirelessly and cost effectively now. Uh, but you know, some of the other things like flooring and HVAC systems, which just they only have a 20-year life cycle, so the, they need to be replaced because that's just kind of the nature of what they are. Um, a few other things is, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity to improve the sustainability and quality of the educational environments. We did find a lot of classrooms that we thought, you know, could use some improvement acoustically. Um, some of them are, are great, and some of them, I think, just it, it need a little work. Uh, and that's not a thing that's, that's really hard to, to resolve. It's something that we can do usually, depending on the space, but usually we can do pretty effectively. Uh, and then there are a lot of, you know, um, your, your school stock for the most part is kind of of that post-war era. And uh, those schools generally have pretty good bones, and a lot of them are in good shape structurally, and, and the basic piece of them and the way they're laid out and the way their work is pretty flexible. But they're 50, 60 years old. And so uh, they don't, we don't, you know, schools don't work the same way they did 50, 60 years ago, and especially going forward, that's changing a lot. And so there's going to be need to be some improvements to accommodate those educational program needs and, and improvements in security and connection to the community because that situation has changed a lot since that time too. And so the, those are some of the issues that I think we've seen as we've have been to your school sites. So the next step, which we're starting on Monday, is uh, master planning. And so at each school site, there'll be a facilities master plan committee that gets formed. Uh, and elementary school sites, we've paired up to have one committee for two school sites that are similar in nature. Um, and, and then the middle schools and high schools all have individual committees, they're, they're larger campuses. And the, the, the job of that committee is to provide input on behalf of that entire school community uh, to the master planning team so that we understand what the needs are from the users of the space, because that's really what's most important. And we've done kind of our technical homework of, does the roof need to be repaired? Does the mechanical need to be replaced a few years down the road? But the teachers and the staff are the ones that are gonna tell us, uh, you know, do we have what we need to do uh, the job that we wanna do? And do we have the facilities that we need to, to meet the requirements that we talked about for the ed spec? And then also, how should that work? And where should those go? And what would be the best way to take advantage of the opportunities that we do have at each school? So uh, this is kind of the, the composition of that committee that we've uh, been working with the principals to set up at each site. So there'll be teachers, uh, representative teachers uh, from, the, from the site, uh, representative staff members, parents, neighbors, and community members, and then of course the district staff as part of that as well. Um, and then this is kind of just a little bit of overview. We have two meetings at each site, and uh, so that's a total of 50 meetings that we'll be having over the next three months. Uh, so we'll be very busy. But the first meeting, uh, just kind of a brief overview of what the agenda will be for each meeting. At the first meeting, we'll kind of give an overview of the overall master planning process. It's important that people understand that this is a very high level analysis and that there'll be a lot more community input before things get built. So uh, we want to think about things really strategically at a high level at this point in time, and then there'll be plenty of opportunities to come back later and, and understand exactly how many cabinets we need in each room and things like that, and, and also understand how these meetings fit into the overall process of kind of what I, I explained to you guys a few minutes ago. Uh, we'll give a brief presentation of what the requirements of the ed spec were for that particular um, school type and sort of that baseline and what we see as our initial reaction to things that need, improvements that need to be made to meet those requirements, and then also what we found as part of our facilities assessment and then get their input on other things we may not have noticed that need to be improved or just general condition of the facilities themselves. And then uh, really, I think one of the overall, just the ground rules, and we have kind of a charter that we'll use for each of these committees and uh, is to make sure that we work collaboratively, that we really try really hard to make sure everyone's viewpoints are heard, that everyone has a chance to speak, that, um, that we make decisions by consensus wherever possible and that everyone can, it's important that you know, we have these discussions together as a group so everyone can hear everyone else's viewpoint. Um, in the second meeting, 
we, in the time between that meeting, so we get to go back to our office and come up with some ideas on how this is all going to come together on that campus. What's the vision for that campus going to be? And so the first thing in the second meeting is for us to show that work and then have a group discussion of that work, have a collaborative kind of working session of, you know, we think the multi, you know, we think there should be a new multi-use room that should go over here instead of you shunned it over here and that, that kind of thing and, and why and how the, that's going to work together to make the best environment for, you know, for learning. Um, and then, uh, you know, a really big part of this is we're not going to be able to afford everything that we want. And we need to be prior thinking about that and prioritizing what's most important. And that's a really important role of this committee is to think about that, to give us feedback on which of these improvements is most important to this school community. And we don't just kind of leave that completely open-ended. We start with three general categories and we'll kind of take a first stab at putting things in those categories and then together as a group we'll uh, prioritize them. And the first one is what we call safe, warm, and dry. So that's the, is the building up to meet code? Uh, does the, you know, making sure the roof doesn't leak, making sure the mechanical system works, making sure uh, all those things are in place. That's kind of baseline. We have to do that before we can do anything else. The next two are, current facility needs, and that's really going to be what do we need uh, to put in place to meet those requirements of the ed spec, to meet those needs to meet for your educational program now. And then the, the third priority is future facility needs and, and what kind of uh, facilities are needed or desired by the community that go beyond that, that basic ed spec level. And, and uh, we get a lot of community input on, you know, I think one of the things that's important about the ed spec is it's a standard, but every school is going to need to interpret that a little bit differently. Um, you know, I think the K-8 schools are a good example of that. I mean, one of the reasons we didn't come up with a standard for that is because each of them is pretty unique on its own. And, uh, and I think it's going to be pulling elements from the elementary and the middle school things and figuring out, okay, how does that work for, you know, for each of the K-8 schools? Um, so th there's, there's a lot of interpretation of that, and that's what we need people's feedback on. But the prioritization is really important because that really helps guide uh, the, you know, the, the district as a whole's decision-making in implementing uh, whatever funding is available through the bond, through state funding, um, you know, whenever we're going to have enough money to do everything we want, and it doesn't all happen at the same time too. So we need to figure out what what happens first. So that's really an important part of the of the puzzle. Good evening. He was on a roll, so I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want to jump in. You know, our role is, you know. The dose of reality piece is the construction piece, and how much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take? And how are we going to implement the plan with less, the least amount of disruption to your curriculum and your school environment? And um, it's it's fun for us because our our part of the team was here back in the modernization 20 years ago, so it's fun for us to go into every space and see how they're functioning, having been here when we had the places all torn apart. So we learned a lot about this district in particular, how each school functions, where should we put interim housing, uh, if we should put interim housing, uh, those types of things we're looking at. So um, I don't want to um, downplay at all the mountain of information right now that's going back and forth between our two firms. If you think about every space in every one of your schools and there's at least five to 25 items in every single room, those lists are being developed. They're being put together in you know, a concise information packets. And then we're putting costs against each item, recommendations on what to do for each item. And then what we'll do is, is uh, after the process that Aaron uh, described, is we'll put costs for all of these items. So when we sit down to do the priorities, you know what things are going to cost. You know what replacement, long-term maintenance, and all of that that goes along with each and every item. Uh, the other thing we're, we're looking at is schedule. You know, from a construction standpoint, uh, in, in the master planning phase, you never want to put, you, know, you never want to just say, okay, we're going to put a new M MU room over here uh, without looking at what utilities are underground, how it would function, and what we may want to put 10 or 15 years down the road. So um, it's a very comprehensive uh, document. You talked, um, Dr. Baldy, earlier you talked about, you know, being part of the flesh of the bond program, but this is a great idea to do whether or not you have a bond program. Your district should have a plan and a vision for your facilities, and this is going to be a working document that you'll be able to use for many, many years. So. And just to 
to conclude, we thought we'd just give you kind of a little bit of what our expected outcomes of the process are in general. Uh, the first is to, is to really engage those school committees in the process, really listen to what they have to say and have a collaborative discussion so that we come to a, a, you know, a consensus understanding of what's best for the school and what that school needs. Uh, and then through that, create an innovative vision for the future of each campus. Uh, and then identify and prioritize what we need to do to get to that vision and pull this all together into a plan that um, is supported by each school and community and uh, makes it clear what, you know, has is a clear guide for decision making for the district in the future. And that's that. Any questions for us? Director Stewart. Thank you. With regard to um, requesting feedback, mm -hmm. um, doing outreach to um, have community and parental involvement in, the, in this process, will it be the uh, duty of the school committee to inform um, their school site community of these meetings and methods for providing feedback or will that be um, something you do up front? Um, you know, and then the follow-up to that is, say for instance, um, a parent, a student, whomever finds out about one of these meetings and is not either available or able to provide their feedback when in the timely fashion that they wanted to, um, is there a method for them doing so e either electronically or through the school committee as the liaison to you? Mm -hmm. um, and that, so it's essentially, th my questions are essentially about um, providing this information to the public and, and their methods for uh, relaying it back to you. Sure, and you're actually reminding me that I, th I think I forgot a slide in this presentation, and that is the, the, the last step in this is community outreach. And uh, the, the way that, um, that we've set this process up and that we think this works best is to have that school committee represent that whole community, but not have those be open community meetings, mm -hmm. because I think it works best to work with a small committee that, that can work together and work collaboratively. And there's gonna be a lot to go through in these meetings and, and tackle those issues. And then uh, when that plan is complete, when they've made their recommendations, um, they can obviously seek, seek um, you know, feedback, seek input from you know, sort of the constituents they represent, if you will. Uh, as part of that process. But then once that's complete, uh, having a, a plan, which is, is something that we're working on for how to get that out to everyone else and get the <coughs> comments. So we'll likely have bigger kind of more town hall kind of meetings uh, throughout the district to present the plans for a number of schools and get feedback from that, you know, maybe larger community for, uh, for all those schools to have a more general open session to, to get that feedback. Uh, we've also talked about, you know, electronic means of getting that out there that's putting on the website or having an other means of trying to get as much information and feedback as we can once we kind of have that draft plan complete. So that's kind of the overall plan and we're, we're still kind of working out exactly what the best way to do that community outreach here in Vallejo is. Thank you. Director Waterman. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I have a few things that have floated to the top of the list in my brain. Uh, first, it's really great to finally have a facilities master plan. It feels like we've got an anchor to the future, and it's exciting. Um, I wonder if we already have the calendar of these site meetings calendar calendared already. As of this morning, I think that was okay. Because yeah. I mean, I'm I'm imagining parents at home watching right now, getting excited about when that's going to come to their school. And um, since we're starting tomorrow, with what school are we going to or tomorrow? You know, I don't remember off the top of my okay. head. Okay. Well, <laughs> nevertheless, I could see that being a really important it's thing. It's on Monday. We're starting on Monday. On, uh, I'm sorry, today is Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, having it on our website, easily accessible, I think would just be a wise thing because I could see um, all the school, school communities mm -hmm. wanting to pencil it in before they yeah. don't uh, get the memo late and then they've planned something else or whatever. Um, so just a thought. I want to make the comment Th that... That'll be done. Yeah. Thank you, Mel. <laughs> sure. I know. Yeah, I think the, the big community <laughs> outreach meetings will be the, the, the time that's really critical and those probably yeah. won't happen until probably like January. Oh, okay, Once great. this whole process is going to be... So there's, we're kind of working on that plan, but that's 
we got a lot of time to okay, put, good, 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 <laughs> put that together and good. notify people well in advance of that. Obviously, we don't want to do that anytime in December or anytime around there. Uh, yeah. so, so that'll be the time when we really want to get that out there and make sure everyone knows and get a lot of participation in those events. Cool. Okay, Sorry. terrific. Um, I also want to um, piggyback on something that Ms. Sears said. I can vouch for it. K-8s are very distinct mm -hmm. little ecosystems. Um, and I can say, having been involved with the charter school at the Davidson site, that um, it's a really easy thing when you're growing it from kindergarten and first grade on to really not even completely grok the middle school thing until it's upon you. Mm. Now, I know that this has been a problem for the charter school. I expect that the Mare Island uh, school is, has learned from some of the issues that we had in that regard. But I just want to say out loud that um, this is a grand opportunity to put something uh, like a protocols in place that are concrete for future K-8s. And I, and I imagine that CAVE is going to need some hand-holding when it comes to this because they're still a very young K-8. What are they now, a K-3? Yeah, they're a K-3 right now. Mm -hmm. So having that school community imagine what they're going to need when they can't even picture their first graders as middle schoolers might be uh, tricky. And that um, perhaps like a, a K-8 collaborative mm -hmm. would serve that sure. that need. And one thing I think that will help that is Maryland's one of our first meetings. So we'll have that meeting by the time <laughs> that we have uh, by the time that we have the meetings with CAVE. So we'll, ha we'll have some yeah. feedback on, on this is what they needed that we can contribute to that, but that's probably a good idea. But I, I, I'm picturing the CAVE parents, the CAVE community being a little like deer caught in the headlights, yeah. you know, just as a... Uh, Whatever. Sure. So, and the last thing is, I didn't see anything here in here about exterior paint. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, we must have got a screaming deal on that blue from like the Navy or something. Because <laughs> that blue is everywhere. Um, I can't drive past Stephen Manor without wanting to paint it. You know, it's got that round piece on the end, and I just want to paint it. Um, so is there anything in here? I mean, I suppose that's not safe, warm, and dry. That's, you know, no, but I, I curb appeal. That's curb appeal. Exactly. Yeah. And so that'll be part of the, the assessment for sure. I think, you know, uh, you have to paint every so often. And so in the scope of what we're going to do, every school is going to need to be painted. Because I'm so guessing that's a 1983 blue. I'm just thinking back to my own high school days. Okay, Mel? <laughs> I had no comment. I think at the time somebody liked blue. I won't mention the name. I wasn't here when that was happening. Okay. I just know about the history of that. Okay. Somewhere. All right. Well, I don't hold the blue against anybody, but I think that it might be time to reconsider. Thank you. <laughs> Director Ubaldi. Thank you for your report. Um, it says here, initial findings, many improvements from the Measure A are holding up. Uh, as you know, uh, both President Wilson and I were in that committee mm -hmm. and were successful in raising 133 point something million dollars. And uh, we commend you. Uh, obviously, it's going to be Van Pell to made that construction mark, and you've done a good job. Thank you. So uh, why do we need you if we're doing such <laughs> a facility <laughs> so you good? Did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Anyway, just uh, want to thank for for the good work that you've done, and appreciate it very much. That was That's my comment. Do we have any cards? Thank you so much for this presentation and uh, the facility plan. It's very much, uh, very important uh, to the district. Um, it becomes our roadmap. Thank, thank you for you. having us and thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Moving to the consent items, 11.6, um, 11.7. Uh, have been pulled. Any others? 11.10, Madam President. 11.10. Director um, Waterman? 11.2, please. 11.2. 11.2, 11.6, 11.7, and 11.10. Is that not correct? That becomes 12.1. 
11.2 is 12.1, 11.6 is 12.2, 11.7 is 12.3, 11.10 is um, 12.4. Okay. Director Mumpson. If there's no further discussion on the remaining ones, I would move to accept them. Approve. Second. It has been moved and seconded <coughs> that we approve 11.1, 11.3, 4, 5, 8, 9, and 11. In discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, those items are now approved. 11, I mean 12.1, contracted services. Director Waterman. Thank you. Um, I think it's important to be clear about the Expeditionary Learning Categorical Block Grant. I know that some people are confused about our relationship with the Vallejo Charter School and how it's funded. Um, I also know for a fact that I've been hearing from some of our uh, teachers and, and uh, parents at the charter school about concerns for having to actually fundraise for some of the things that I see listed here. So can someone speak to, um, to this, what the meaning of the Categorical Block, block Grant is for the public? Sarah just walked out on me. <laughs> <laughs> Trustee Sarah. Waterman, are you referring to the items that are above the Expeditionary Learning Contracted Services contract? I the see. Consultant okay. 22 direct service days yes. and the conference. Mm -hmm, the conference, yes. Yes, so um, the, the Vallejo Charter School, even though it is a dependent charter has a separate line item mm -hmm. for their categorical block grant. So all of these, uh, all of these things that are listed here um, will be funded through the categorical <laughs> block grant. They will not um, be needing to fundraise. Um, I actually met with two members of the Charter Council last Friday, I believe, and um, we went over some of the um, expenditures that the Charter Council has been able to fund through the block grant in the past, and we believe that all of those things will be able to be funded through the allocation that's being made this year, as well as the carryover, which will also be coming back to the Charter School. And what would that be? Well, I suppose that'll be a future. As item. soon as we close, we'll know what okay. the carryover is. Well, I thank you for clarifying that, because I, um, I wasn't that anxious about it, but I know that there are some questions at the school, so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. 12.2. Um, uh, what? Okay. Yes. 12.1. Uh, the, I have a question, Madam President, on the Continental Omega Club. Uh, who oversees that? When, when someone, Just you know, contract. we grant them the, the uh, 43 grand, and, but who actually oversees the work and making sure that our expectations are, are met? Thank you. So this is actually a part of our after school program. So our after school coordinators, along with the site administration, oversees the after school programs, including all of our partners, including the um, Continental Mega, uh, Continentals of Omega um, Club, th those folks that are coming on board. Okay, um, in other words, uh, what, what kind of, um, training do the the uh, teachers or instructors or what do you what's their background what's their um, uh, um, qualification to to do the work that's needed to help those young boys and girls so we partner with several different organizations. One of them is the Continentals who have experience in running um, after school homework clubs, um, tutoring, helping the students complete their homework, as well as GVRD that runs um, many of our recreation programs. So what we do is we bring partners into our after school programs that already have expertise in the areas that we have a need um, in our programs. And uh, how how often do we evaluate their uh, 
the, uh, the work that they've done and are they meeting their goals and so on and so forth. So our, our after school programs are, um, we, we have a pretty comprehensive reporting system that includes um, not only the quality of our programs, which is evaluated and um, looked at by both our site administrators as well as district staff that's supporting out at the school, as well as looking at things that are a part of the, um, the annual reports that we submit where we look at data like um, are we maintaining our attendance? Do students, are students wanting to come to our program by showing up? So um, tho those kinds of things are um, overseen by our after school coordinator, but supported by both our administrators at the district level as well as at the site. So, um, they, so they report back to, to to us, how well they're doing, or, 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 or they're not, not they're meeting the challenge. Correct. And one of the things that um, that we've really, um, since Dr. Bishop has has been here, we've really been putting some extra attention on our after school programs. In the past, they were sort of programs that just sat over here, and principals. Um, may or may not be really monitoring and looking at the quality of those programs. <coughs> we realize the importance of those programs, so we're really putting some extra attention on looking at the quality of them, as well as making sure that we're aligning what happens in those after-school programs with what happens in the regular school day. So they truly are extended school day programs. Okay. I hope that uh, there will be a time when we can have some uh, report and evaluation of after-school program. And so that would be one of my requests that uh, we consider that. Thank you so much for your response. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Madam President. Item 12.2, Lease Agreement Leaders in Community <coughs> Alternatives, Inc. Um, my question is uh, this services district students? Uh, this community, um, what's the name of the pro community? It's, uh, it's, a, it's a program that um, addresses uh, the students of you know uh, ages of 14 um, through 17 and a half years old, and those would be district students. And there may be other students. I'm not quite sure what their whole um, you know, even uh, what the selection is, but it's, it's most likely district students. I can, var you know, validate that, but that's a program that they have, and I'm not quite sure what they're, who those students are. We just get revenue for the spaces that they're using. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say something? Okay, follow up. Okay, because it sounds like a good program. It, yeah, it is, and I, and I believe it's our students, all of, uh, but you know, 100%, I'm not sure if it's every single one of the students are ours. Our students. I don't know where else it would be coming from. Okay, then I'd like to uh, uh, pull this one for further. Okay, uh, we'll come back. We'll uh, tell you about the students. Okay. Yeah, uh, and I'd like to know more about the program. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. <coughs> Sounds like a good one. Okay, a uh, twelve point three Loma Vista Environmental Sciences Academy. <coughs> Who asked? Oh, uh, Deborah Sears. <laughs> I'm sorry, Deborah. Is there a question or I, what I, what oh, I, it's from it's community oh, member. Sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm, no problem. Um, the, in the fiscal impact, it said something about community facilities. Number two is the funding. Explain that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's a stupid question, but I'm, I'm guessing you might've told me something about that before, Mal. <laughs> yeah, you, you had a question on different fundings throughout the community and we uh -huh. have uh, community facilities district number two, which is the Northgate area. That's the Hidden Brook and the uh, Jesse Bethel Ward Law area. CFD, CFD number three is spotted areas. Then we have developer fees. Those are all uh, basically revenue areas where um, for, for growth that deal with growth. So when you're saying the phrase community facilities number two, it's actually a, a special tax assessment. Right. So, so this is not coming through general state <coughs> revenue funds. That's why it's not impacting our general fund. Right. It's so could we clarify that just so our community knows what that means? I mean, maybe you guys do, but, you know, a little phrase of 
from the generous taxpayers of Vallejo property owners. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> we'll clarify it. Okay, item 12.4, uh, a Vala Vista Street property bill of sale for two portable classrooms. <coughs> Who has it? I, I do, Madam President. Okay. Thank you. I just want to know, this is a bill of sale. Does that mean it, we, we, we sold it and, and there's an amount that we received for the sale of those two portables? Um, as I recall, we basically have to do a bill of sale, but I don't think we sold them for very much money or yeah, anything. Me, yeah, thank I'll you let Mel take this. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Steve, for coming up. Uh, what happened on this one? We had um, surplus properties in certain areas. One of the surplus properties was the Vala Vista site, which actually we sold, but there were uh, portables on that site that we thought we sold with it, but they said uh, they, they don't want, they didn't, that was part of, that part of what they thought was the sale. So what we did was um, they were surplus property, so we went out and uh, did a call out um, and we advertised to um, invite, um, especially um, community such as churches and whatever who we interested in buildings rather than us just, just you know basically just wiping them off. So when we uh, there was a church um, that um, acquired two of them, they took care of all the costs to remove it, take it to the site. And it went to a school district. Um, I mean, went to a, a um, it went to this church. And then what they did was that when they were trying to, um, and we didn't, they didn't, co it didn't cost them anything. Actually, it was just the cost was them taking care of the cost of removing the portables, which is like four or five thousand dollars. What happens is that when they're trying to um, build or you know, place the site, place the buildings on a on a on the site where they're putting these buildings. The building department in this uh, particular city went on and said that they needed a, some kind of transaction that the buildings were actually theirs. So we wanted to make sure it was clear um, that um, the board um, understood what we were doing here. And that was just basically just securing um, um, this kind of documentation so the so this church would not have problems when they applied to the building department. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. Are there any other questions? If not, I'll um, entertain. I am asking that 12.2 be tabled um, to the next to a future meeting. So approval for 12.1, 12.3, and 12.4. I so move, Madam Chair. A second. It has been moved and seconded that we approved item 12.1, 12.3, and 12.4. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Items 12.1, 12.3, and 12.4 are approved. Con community forum, if needed, I have no cards. Future board agenda items. Um, Director Waterman. Thank you. Um, it, it, it's come to my attention that we are in full, li like I mentioned earlier, full throttle fundraising season. and. Um, as I think about our vision for our children and what we expect to teach our kids, either um, directly or indirectly through the culture that we're creating here, I find some, I am finding myself becoming increasingly more concerned about the things that we expect our children to do after hours to help fund our programs. Um, we do not want our children to eat garbage but we expect them to sell garbage to their <laughs> neighbors and to their families so that what they love at school can be funded. Uh, we do not want our children to constantly throw things away that are meaningless. We want to teach them uh, good consumer skills, life skills. And yet we are positioning our children to take uh, out of their homework time, out of their play time, out of their personal time, time to uh, hawk wares. I know that there are lots of fundraising. I remember this great quote. Um, Private schools are what you pay for. Public schools are what you fundraise for. And I know that fundraising is part of what it takes to really beef up um, our environments for our kids. I would like to see some district direction on creating some sort of standards, some sort of framework 
I don't know exactly how that's going to look, but I, I think that it would be because we know that it's going to happen and we know that our, our school communities are kind of like on their own when it comes to this. I think that we as leaders would be wise to help create some kind of framework for them to, to look at and things that they can consider. These, there's just, there are some big companies that really make m serious money off of these efforts for our kids. We might get 20%, they get 80%, and they're just, I'm not, and it's garbage. So <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? I, I think that it's a wise place for us to start going, especially since we're at the beginning of it. I know my kids came home with their very first fundraising thing. You know, it's, it's already a heated discussion in the house. There's all kinds of crazy sale tactics. My kids, the whole school was made to watch a sales video during their lunch break. I think <coughs> there's some issues with this, you know, captive audience and pumped up network marketing kind of thing that we're asking our children to do. And not only outside of school, but in this case, it's actually infiltrating the school day and the school culture. So um, if we could t turn our attention to that a little bit so that we can help our kids in our school communities who are very serious and very committed to raising funds um, do it wiser, more sustainably, more responsibly, more effectively, et cetera. Thank you. Director Ubaldi. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'd like to, to, to for the for us to look into the uh, my first request, of course, was the effectiveness evaluate effectiveness of our school after school program. The second one is the second. The second one is I would like to for us to have a report on the last comparative analysis of our from uh, for the last four or five years of our grantmanship. And um, how, how effective have we, we, we have uh, done some grantmanship for, for our school? In other words, um, uh, how much grant have we received from year, you know, just, I'm just suggesting the last four or five years. And, uh, and what particular grant did we receive particular category and and uh, is it how much is that from uh, from the federal from the state and philanthropical and um, I think that you could probably do a better job than categorizing them but I'm just curious how well we're doing in regards to grantmanship thank you appreciate it madam president um, I would like to have the study session or a meeting uh, regarding the time of school board meetings. If we take a survey of the audience, right? <laughs> now, it is now eight, a little after eight. The seat is still empty. <laughs> okay. And then um, <laughs> um, the date for the Vallejo High School uh, October meeting for grand jury follow up. I also like would like a uh, presentation on, I know we have several things that we're doing concerning um, uh, addressing our dropout rate. I'd like a uh, uh, presentation on that. I'd like a, at the end of the quarter uh, for the adult school, a, um, pres a report as an update report on how the first quarter or whatever session of the uh, adult school. And then I would like for us to set the date um, for the John W. Finty, Finney High School um, dedication uh, of their new sign. I understand um, uh, the men of Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated have uh, Vallejo Fairfield Chapter have, are purchasing the sign and um, they are bugging me about when <laughs> it's going to be uh, put in place and unveiled. And so we would want to do a very short uh, uh, program. Director Ubaldi. I was uh, interviewed by the press today in regards to the Ursula Awards. 
and and he asked me what what change and what particular change is taking place this year and one of the very first thing that I mentioned is the fact that uh, we have had more film turned in for uh, record for uh, review to so we can uh, re reward the, the the winners and we've had more dramatic change in numbers of turn in from the education community. On Jesse Bethel alone, there were 22 film. And then there were four from uh, the county. And so um, I just thought I'd let you be informed that uh, there are some dramatic things happening in a multimedia community. And I'm really, really excited. And I hope you would be there to, to cheer for these young folks who want to become filmmakers. And so I thought I, I'd address that, uh, Madam President, before we uh, adjourn. Thank you. Okay, we've done all that. Uh, upcoming meetings. The next governing board meeting will be on Wednesday, October 2nd. If there's nothing else, this meeting is